Good evening, everyone. Uh, the, the meeting is now called to order. This is the Finance and Economic Development Committee meeting of December 7th, 2021. I am the chair, Chris Johnson, from the 7th District. At this time, I will do a roll call for members of the committee. Uh, Vice Chair Harley, 4th District. Councilwoman Oliver, 3rd District. Present. Councilmember Field, 8th District. At large, Councilmember Walsh. Here. At large, Councilmember Spadola. Um, and Council President Congo. Here. At this time, I will also like to acknowledge other members of council here tonight, uh, council member Fields, 5th District. Here. <clears throat> council member Darby, 2nd District. Present. Uh, council member Gray, 1st District. Present. So. And council member McCoy, 6th District. Present. Here. And I believe we have at large council member Dixon. Here. All right. Um, as a friendly reminder, only members of the committee should be making motions and seconding. Um, and due to the tight uh, space constraints, uh, we are back in person, but we still do have many limitations due to the ongoing um, virus concerns. Um, so with that, we, we do have a, uh, we, we're at max capacity if you're coming to the city council um, building. Um, but with that said, if you do want to sign up for public comment in person, you can sign up. However, you have to remain outside the chambers. And then um, as members speak, then we can rotate members of the public back out. So we just wanted everyone to know that we are at, at max capacity for in person um, as we're looking to um, keep everybody safe and sound, um, especially in, the, in, in this room, all right? Um, and as well as we have members online virtually, of course, that's always an option as we still have the hybrid option. So uh, if you're not able to make it down, please uh, feel free to participate online. Um, there's also a housekeeping matter. Again, we have a pretty lengthy agenda. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to obviously keep uh, things flowing. We're going to keep things moving. And uh, we're, we're here to, of course, engage and go through these items. Now, prior to me starting, are there any questions from members of council here this evening? OK. And as a reminder, anyone from the public who wishes to speak in person, again, we have the in-person sign up here if you wish to speak publicly. And as well as online, uh, we have that handy raise hand feature to participate on, on, on Zoom. So please feel free to let me know. I will be watching to make sure that uh, everyone can engage tonight. All right, and without further ado, um, there is, uh, again, I'm just gonna go in sequence. Um, as to what have we have the agenda listed. Uh, we do have an ordinance, ordinance 21-47. This is an ordinance to enact a temporary moratorium on water service disconnections. Um, and this is an ordinance, so it must be voted out of committee. Um, is there anyone here to speak on this agenda item? Yes, um, Councilwoman Darby from the 2nd okay. District. Now, what, what we're going to do, because I, I know we have a, just kind of how we normally do, um, I believe there is a PowerPoint here. So um, we do have a PowerPoint from the administration. Um, and then the sponsor, we would go into um, your piece in support of the legislation, and then we'll go to members of the public. So that's the way we'll, we'll, we'll keep it moving. So um, without further ado, I believe we have a chief of staff, uh, Ms. Tanny Washington from the administration. Also, we have uh, finance director, Mr. Brett Taylor. And I believe you do, again, have a um, just administration's um, input on this ordinance. So. Uh, the floor is yours, Finance Director. 
Oh, and I would like to count, recognize Council Member Michelle Harley is with us in person. Pleasure to see you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my name is Brett Taylor. I am the Director of Finance for the City of Wilmington. And I'll be commenting on the, uh, on the ordinance uh, regarding a temporary moratorium on water disconnections. Uh, I do want to set the tone for this and that to uh, suggest to you that we are very sensitive to uh, people's issues regarding uh, water, water service, and water disconnections. Um, but there are some realities that we have to face and we're trying to manage them the best we can. What we wanted to do is lay out some facts for you that might be helpful. Uh, as you can see from the, we're gonna have some PowerPoint slides and we'll have some facts here and we'd be happy to take questions. Uh, but first and foremost, we have about 37, uh, 37,500 uh, utility customers served by the city of Wilmington. Uh, approximately 24,500 of those are within the city limits and approximately 13,000 are outside the city limits in the county um, and um, the one thing that we have uh, noticed over the years particularly when the new administration had come in um, that we had a very high level of delinquency within our water uh, accounts receivable <coughs> Uh, there are currently 11,000, roughly 11,500 customers with delinquencies of 30 days or more. And this totals $23 million in accounts receivable that's outstanding in the water, uh, in the water fund. Approximately 8,000 residential customers owe approximately $6.5 million. Now keep in mind that we have 37,000 customers, but those customers may also have multiple accounts because they have rental properties. They may, um, there are also uh, accounts that uh, are longstanding but uh, have not been transferred from property owner to property owner. So those are ones that we would uh, also have on our, on our uh, registry. Uh, and many of the delinquencies are longstanding dating back, you know, a lot of them may go back as far as a decade. One other particular thing that you should keep in mind is that you know, we have several components of your water sewer fund. We have the water component, which is water delivery, but we have the wastewater uh, charges that are associated with that. And we also have stormwater charges. And in a lot of cases, we have a number of commercial entities and residential customers that still owe not only the water and water, wastewater portion, but also the stormwater portion. These are accounts that we have actively work every day and we try to communicate with customers about what they owe. Go to the next slide, please. Now, the city of Wilmington uh, operates a water utility for the regional area. Um, the, um, it is a self-funded utility, <coughs> meaning that everything that we, all the charges and fees that we uh, charge customers go back into the water operation the water, wastewater, and stormwater operation. Uh, none of the funds go into the general fund. Uh, the projected revenue in FY21 is, uh, this will be a year ending, well, it had year ending um, uh, uh, June 30th, but keep in mind that the audit is not completed, so this is an unaudited number, but we had approximately $93 million coming mainly from direct user fees of 62.9 million. The uses of these revenues go into operations, which operations, maintenance, and capital improvements, which re represents about 77 million. And then the remainder goes into things such as debt service, keeping reserves uh, so that we, um, in case of uh, emergencies and reserves in case um, uh, in reserves for the debt service involved. The losses in revenue result in reductions in water quality and service and could cause potential rate increases for customers. So anything that we defer in terms of revenues raised, either through a more, you know, water disconnection moratorium or in the last 16 months, cases whereby 
COVID-19 is hitting households and households are unable to pay. <coughs> Those losses in revenue figure in directly into how we operate the water utility and we have to monitor, we have to manage that um, as those revenues come in. We manage that through a number of ways. Uh, we've gone out for refunding of bonds. We go out, we reduce our, um, uh, we try to. We got more people coming in can, can we take any uh, conversation outside? And again, I know our max capacity. Yeah, but we'll make sure. Turn away the speakers. You can't turn away people. This taxpayers. No, we're not. We're not. Everybody wants to turn away. Can you say you ain't got enough spot? So take it to chambers. No. Oh, let's go. All right. Then. So, so if you could continue, Director Taylor. Sure. Shall we move to include more people? But excuse me. Uh, point of order, ma'am. We, we are. Again, we're limited, uh, you know, in space, but again, we will accommodate everyone. So whether you're online, in person, virtual, we're in a, still in a pandemic, so we're trying to make sure everybody's safe, okay? All right. Um, now, Director, if you could continue. Okay. You can go move forward. So as I was saying that, you know, there's lots of reasons why we would be faced with some revenue losses. One of those was obviously during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the state of emergency that the state of Delaware and the city of Wilmington were under. Um, the city of Wilmington imposed a moratorium on disconnections uh, between March 2020 and March 2021. Now, these are unaudited figures because we're still working through the uh, water sewer fund uh, financials, but uh, we approximate this uh, loss in revenue attributed to this moratorium to about five million dollars. Now, when we restarted the disconnections after July one, and between July one and October uh, October two thousand twenty one, uh, the city issued six hundred and thirty five disconnections. We're running approximately 75 disconnections a week. Now, these are disconnection notices. These are disconnection notices. What we've seen is when the disconnection notice goes out, we got approximately 50% of those individuals coming in. They've been notified and they come in and make payment. Another third come in and make a payment agreement, whereby uh, the remaining third, I'm sorry, the remaining quarter, about half come in they make payment, about a quarter of them come in and uh, pay the payment agreement, and then a quarter comes in and uh, they, they do not come in and they do not have their water service reserved. So of those 635 water disconnections, 103 customers have not had their water service resumed. And that's just within the last four that's months. Now, as I said at the very beginning, we are very sensitive to the situations of individuals. And we have really taken, we are earnest in taking steps to help these individuals. Uh, one of the things in the last three years, a couple of the things that we've done as a city administration. First, we've reduced the interest rates on delinquent utilities from 3% to 5.5% per month. This was done because we noticed that uh, a 3% per month rate was just unsustainable for individuals that uh, were back to, had back due bills. We <coughs> introduced flexibility payment options for customers, including reductions in penalties and interest and payment terms up to four years. I worked personally with our current services staff on making decisions about what payment agreements should be uh, there for, uh, for customers. Uh, in many cases, you know, we, we take into account the person's individual situations. Uh, we currently have about 630 payment agreements that we have, been, we have entered into over the last two years and are, are actively working. <coughs> So 600, about 630 uh, individuals have come in and made those payment arrangements. We introduced the utility assistance program. 
which provided up to $3,000 in assistance for income eligible customers. In fact, we took the what was previously recommended as the DHSA income threshold at 125 percent, and we increased it to 200 percent of the federal poverty level. So we have a much more flexible. We have a much more flexible uh, income limit than, say, the state has. Excuse me. I would like to make an announcement to people in attendance. We have meets brass capacity, so what we would say is, if you were the last three people to come in, we we, we gotta we gotta have you participate on Zoom. You can sign in. We can have you participate, but you have to watch out. Unfortunately, we're cramped here. Um, again, I I would rather not have someone stand at the door, but we must have it spaced out. Um, no, it's, we we have a certain order. Um, so I believe the last three people. Or you guys report them because there's a problem with order bill that you try to get through a Point of order. We have. I think this is very important. When you're doing the people's wrong, we, we have you should have had a bigger plate. You got the council power member. to move this right now. You got the council power to move this. I have it. Point of order. We will the last three people. If you could kindly, we'll get you back in here. We just need to create more space. So if anyone can kindly oblige, we can have, you'll get to participate, okay? Um, so I did see a, a lady come in recently, um, and as well as two more people, well, one more person now. If you could kindly go outside, uh, I believe ma'am, so you, you just came in. You guys are not going to move to the chambers. You're going we we to can't make that call. The Newcastle County Sorry, has that facility. No, Ma'am, Ma to again, we have to have certain order, okay? We have to the whole thing up. Yes, ma'am. What is your concern? I'm asking you a question. Um, if you're not going to move to the chambers, you want to keep it at this capacity and then allow people to come in and speak as you call them in. Correct. So they won't be able to sit in on a meeting and hear anything, but y'all come in and hear bits and pieces. Well, well, we do have Zoom. We have Zoom capability, so you can okay. call in um, in the hallway if that's the way that you know it okay. makes it work. Okay. Again, this is extraordinary yeah. times, so, you know. So I appreciate everybody complying with us. Okay. We will make sure you're heard. Okay. Again, we're just going to take a brief uh, rest while people transition. I want to make sure everyone's heard because um, we are going some very important information. So that we're, I think we're, all right. And again, if you're on transit on the way here, you can, will be heard in person, or we do have the Zoom option. Okay. So again, I sincerely appreciate everyone working with us um, as we we move through this. So. Without further ado, um, Director Floor okay. George. Um, we were talking a little bit about the administration's <coughs> response to uh, providing Great. customer assistance. Uh, we've introduced a utility assistance program, which covers up to three thousand dollars in assistance uh, to income eligible customers to cover back water bills. As I stated before, our income guidelines are much more. Uh, uh, robust than say the state and federal guidelines and we would uh, have people eligible up to 200% of the federal poverty level uh, federal poverty guidelines uh, as um, stated through the state and the federal government so uh, any individual who may meet those income requirements certainly can come in and participate as part of the program we've allocated four hundred and ninety thousand dollars in funding to assist with the program. We've also collaborated with the state Delaware, uh, Delaware State Housing Authority to assist seniors on utility assistance. And uh, very recently, we're now partnering with the State Division of Public Health on the Low Income Housing Water Assistance Program. Uh, this is a new program. This is federal money that has been allocated uh, to the state of Delaware uh, through the Division of Public Health. We're working with the Division of Public Health to figure out a 
a, uh, a mechanism to get the word out to our customers. They have approximately two and a half million dollars available with another tranche of money coming <coughs> shortly. Um, we want to, to be sure that uh, everyone in the city of Wilmington is aware of that program and we'll be communicating that in the next couple weeks. Finally, some takeaways that I would like to just uh, mention. If, if I was to emphasize anything with respect to the water disconnections, is that you know the city administration recognizes that water service is critical to the quality of life for its residents. Absolutely quite critical. We have some of the best water quality. We work very diligently with our public works folks to make sure that, that we have uh, efficient service and the quality of the water is there, but it has to be paid for. The city administration, the city of Wilmington in itself, including city council and, and all involved in, uh, in our organization, has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure the water utility, that the water utility remain operational and financially solvent. And that is done through the user, direct user fees uh, and uh, the other revenues that we accumulate uh, through the program. Customers who don't pay their bills on time are effectively subsidizing those that do not. And in a lot of cases, we, there is a certain threshold that we can sustain. Uh, we have a large accounts receivable, however, and anything that does not come in in terms of revenues that sits out there as being due, uh, being due to, the, to the city for the operation of the water facility, has to be made up someplace else. And that's either through um, uh, other people's uh, charges and fees or increases in the water rents. Water moratoriums, and we've seen this, particularly through the, the COVID-19, water moratoriums don't stop customers from the obligation to pay. And it's primarily because the, the, the users are in fact using the water, consuming the water, and we have to not only deliver it, but also clean it and make sure that it's available to everyone within our customer base. What we'd rather not see is customers go into further debt by not paying the bill. As a result, just because you have a disconnection does not, and you continue to use the service, does not necessarily mean that that debt goes away. Rather, we'd rather have you come in and talk to us. Okay. We have programs to help. Water disconnections are, all, are sometimes the only means of encouraging customers to pay their what utility bill. We do ample communication. Not only do you get a bill, second bill, third bill, but then we send a director's letter out saying that you're in arrears. Then we, you know, sometimes a water disconnection notices some way, the only way to prompt people to come in. What we do have, however, is also a collection unit. What we've done is we've gone from the very beginning at the, at the very top of those who owe us and worked our way down and we're reaching out through our collection unit to those people who have delinquencies, starting with the lowest owers. And those are usually commercial, apartment buildings, rental complexes and the like. We're working those accounts just as earnestly as we're working those uh, who uh, residential customers who may owe bills. So we're figuring other ways to take some of the pressure off of that. So the takeaways are that we recognize that people are, are hurting. We have a fiduciary responsibility to keep the, play, uh, keep the water utility operational. Um, we don't want people to get in any further debt. Don't and we want to make sure that uh, people are cognizant that they have a delinquency out there. Most important, this is the most important message, this is the last slide, is that we will work with customers to assist them in meeting their obligations. Okay? All they have to do is call 311. 311 is set up to take a customer's call and we will be uh, directing those customers to our account services staff. The account services staff will take, uh, uh, will engage with the customer. Sometimes, uh, just to be fair, sometimes uh, 
a customer may not get directly to the account services agent, but we will take a ticket, a telephone number, a contact name, and our agents will reach back out to those customers to have them come in and have a conversation with us about how we can help them. And like I said, we have ample payment agreements. We have resources at our disposal. We think that it's just more effective to work with the customers rather than push the, through a water disconnection moratorium, push the problem out further and further into the future. So with that, I'd be happy. That's the end of my presentation, and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Um, a few, and, and I thank you very much, <laughs> Director Taylor. I have a few pointed questions to bring up just uh, obviously I think all all council members have received a lot of feedback on this issue and it's a very important issue and there's some um, just pointed questions I have specifically in regards to um, my, my first question is the uh, age of accounts um, I understand that there's approximately 11,000 delinquent accounts do we have an, a, a breakdown of the age like or, or most from the past year and a half or most most are from the older? past year and a half I, I would say that we've seen that uptick pretty considerably in the past year and a half. And again, that makes it more important for us to, uh, to address those issues because the longer you keep them out there, the longer they age, and the harder it is to collect. Okay. Um, and the second point is uh, a question in regards to sheriff sales. We've heard uh, information about homes going to sheriff sale um, just for uh, water bills. Is that true? We have very few that go to, to, uh, to sheriff sales just for water bills. It's usually a combination. What we've done for, with sheriff sales is that we've set a threshold. If you have $10,000 or over, then you may be subject to a sheriff sale. To get to $10,000 on a water utility is pretty significant, considering the average water bill is approximately $90. Now, <laughs> most, most water bills are in the are in the 40 to $50 range. If you're at $90, you're probably the average, but that's the average considering commercials, rentals, and whatnot. If you're at $10,000 on the utility bill, you've got a pretty significant problem. What it is is usually what happens is these are customers that have a combination of water bills, property tax arrearages, and lot and L and I instant tickets. These are violations for things like high grass, keeping unkept facility, um, and the like. So, you know, going to sheriff sale, you know, and the other thing is that our sheriff sales, I think the highest the number of sheriff sales we've ever gone to in a month is 35. Of that, half of those made payment prior to even it going to the floor of the auction. And I would say mm, approximately a quarter of that ends up coming back to the city because the either the individual did not pay for it and there was no applicable bidder. So I would say that they're very, very few and far between. By the way, we also put a moratorium on sheriff sales between March 20th and July 2021. And the last question, um, at least that I have, I know several council members have questions directly for administration, is in regards to um, the, these payment arrangements. Um, are there income qualifications? Uh, or is there certain thresholds? Or can anybody pick up the phone and call, and will they get a, a payment plan? Anybody can call and make a payment plan. I will say that there are programs, like under the Utility Assistance Program, where we contribute money towards the bill, that does have an income threshold. But if, say, you don't make the income threshold, you can still call us and we can talk about how to structure the payment options for you to pay that down over time. Okay. Thank you very much, Director. All right, I'm going to open up to members of the committee for questions specifically to the administration. Um, Council Member Oliver, I believe you had your hand raised first. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chip. Um, Brent, uh, could you, uh, you said the notices that went out. Um, could you explain that then? You said first notice, second notice, third notice, and then two letters, and then you get a 24 or 78 uh, hour notice. How does that go? Could you repeat that? Because I heard some of sure. it. Sure. So you get your first notice, which is your, your bill, 
Say that again. You get your first notice, which is your bill. Uh -huh. The second and third notice would have the bank, the balances from the previous bill on there. Second and then the third notice has the, the balance of the bill. Uh huh. And then what we would send is what we call a director's letter. The director's letter is simply, um, we noticed that you have a delinquency. Would you kindly contact our office to satisfy the delinquency? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> At that point, we would then, if we get no response, and the time is indeterminate in terms of how long it takes, uh, we try to, uh, the reason it's indeterminate is that we may issue 75 96 hour notices. You have 96 hours to come in and satisfy the bill. But from a capacity standpoint, the Department of Finance and Public Works can only shut off so many customers in a given week. Mm -hmm. So it has to be scheduled. In many cases, we aren't able to shut off a, a customer's water because we can't access either the house or the, the shutoff valve. So, so I guess what I'm saying, so the final, the first bill, the second bill, the third bill, then you send out a direct letter, then you send out a 96-hour uh, notice, which gives you four more days. Um, and when you say the letters and you send it a direct, that gives you what roughly about a whole month before we even get to that. Is that correct? That's correct. In, in process, mm -hmm. we're talking about six months before you were even in the in the queue to have that water disconnection happen. Well, my next question, may I follow up, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. My next question, uh, when we, um, because I've talked to you, dealt with you on a regular basis, and you have helped out a lot of individuals in the third district and throughout the city of Wilmington. And um, when we said uh, about, the, uh, about the combining bills, most of them, when I didn't hear you say, a lot of them bills who did, the few that did go to a sheriff's sale, a lot of the individual landlords lived out of state. They not even, most of them don't live around here. Most of them are from um, out of state landlords who have accumulated all these fines. Um, next, I would like to bring up uh, out of 635, well, 36,000 people that received their water bill, only 635 received disconnects, but only out of the 635, only 103 were disconnected. And they were only disconnected because they didn't make payment arrangements. Is that correct? The 635 received water disconnections. 105 remain un, uh, unresumed. Okay. So of that 600, the, the balance had made arrangements mm -hmm. to come in and pay. And it was either in, they paid in full or they had a payment arrangement applied. Thank you. Um, may I follow up? Yes. And one of the main things that I would like to mention while we're at, on this committee, it's a lot of individuals who work in the water, the work in the water department, mm -hmm. a lot of women and men who've been working there for years who have came to city council and have begged us to say, look, we don't want this moratorium because this would cause us to lose our job. And I don't think a lot of people realize that that would be close to the city losing out on $4 million. You're not talking about water bills. These are people's jobs. I mean, we had two women uh, come last week who are trying to retire. And if this, just say this moratorium um, hypothetically goes through, they may lose their, lose their jobs. And they've been here in the city for 20 something years. I mean, because the phone won't ring. If we don't pay our water bill, I mean, I've been one that had to make payment arrangements. I have family members, I have close friends that have made payment arrangements. And sometimes the payment arrangements um, used to be a little high, but based on since Brett has taken over, and I have to give you credit because you changed a lot of things in that department. Uh, a lot of people don't know how hard you have worked in that department to change for the better that a lot of people from where I live from used to be disconnected on a regular basis. And Brett had changed that and told me, Xanthia, that I, I, I have this position and I can assure you that I will work with anyone you send me. So I have to say, you know, I'm not saying everything is perfect, but 
on his clock, he has not disconnected anyone in the district that I represent because I put out, and I think it's all about communication, you have to put out information to your constituents. Um, the city has put out a lot of information, maybe they can do better, but guess what? If my board is being cut off, I'm gonna call somebody. But if you call 311, and as Brett has said, um, you get a ticket, and they are calling back, and they're not disconnecting. Um, so I'm gonna let someone else talk before I uh, say my final um, words. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments by members of the committee? This is specifically for the administration, as I know the sponsor still has a lot of information as well to provide. All right, I'm looking online. Uh, Council Vice Chair Harley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions um, at this time, but I do want to say that I think that our director, our finance director, made it very, very clear tonight as it related to all the efforts that are made to avoid disconnections tonight. So for those that were not aware, of the different efforts, the funding, um, and the advocacy and support um, that the city already has in place, they know tonight. And, and not only that, but we have it recorded. So hopefully um, for those that are advocating for individuals uh, to avoid disconnects, that they can use this video um, that is being tape tonight to share with them that this is what you can do to avoid a disconnect because from what I already knew before tonight um, we, we're helping there's money there's advocacy there's support and I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what is the need for this legislation when you have all this help so I wanted to make a statement versus having a question thank you mr. chair right, thank you thanks very much vice chair Harley and with that, uh, we do, I guess, have the, the lead sponsor. I believe Council Member uh, Darby is on the line, so she may be able to answer some of those questions. Floor is yes, um, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, I do want to make a few points, and I know I'm going to have closing remarks, so I'm just going to make a few points. Um, at first, I want to say that. Um, we have the information that's being stated to help people. And that's exactly what the Community Homes Campaign and other people are doing. We're actually going door to door, knocking on people's door, giving them information about how they can get assistance with their water bill. So that's not new information for us. Um, also, the need is that the community has reached out. The community has said that this is a need the community has said this is a problem. Um, so that is the reason why this legislation was put up. Um, I did a few um, walkthroughs or canvassing through my district and spoke to people who either had their water disconnected or received the letters. And one thing I do want to say is that a lot of times we paint these pictures that, there's, that there are families who just, oh, I just don't want to pay, you know? Um, most people want to pay their bills. Most people want to, you know, be able to have the funds and money to be able to live and survive and have basic things, but that's just not the case. Um, some people just do not have the funding to do it. It's not, not like people are just saying, I don't want to pay my bill, I'm not going to pay it. Right, so what about those people? And another thing that no one, has, we are failing to mention that we're in the middle of a pandemic the third variant has been Omicron, Omarion, whatever they calling it, it is out here. We're in the middle of a pandemic where water is essential to proper hygiene. Water is essential to hand washing, to not spreading this virus, right? So I think it's so key that we're forgetting we are in the middle of a pandemic. It is not over and we're entering into the worst season already where you know, in the winter time, people get flu, they get sick. We're entering into the worst season and we have families with water cut off. And another thing I wanna hit on is there's no proof anyone will lose a job because of a moratorium. That is not a fact. And I want to make sure that we're speaking facts when we're on here. Use statistics, use data. Do not just bring up things that you think may happen or may not happen, use facts. Another thing is also important to point out that renters, many of whom the water is not in their name or being punished with water shutoffs. 
when their landlords don't pay their water bills. I once was a renter, and I remember how hard it is to find a good landlord and a nice home here to rent here in Wilmington. It is the hardest thing. And I find my home and my landlord does not find pay the water bill. What do you think happens to me and my family? The shutoffs are happening at the unit at units being rented. And despite the fact that the bill is in the name of the landlord, that is unfair. So when we talk about notices going out, are renters getting notices or are the landlords getting the notices? Because the landlords are in renters and we live in a city that is majority renters. So we're not thinking about the renters, right? And another point I want to hit on is that we're asking for public works to do more outreach and give people the information they need to help them access resources to paying their water bill. And um, I also want to make it clear that residents cannot access the utility payment assistance program right now. The program is off, and when customers call, there they are not able to apply as of, like if they call today or tomorrow, they're not able to apply for funds. It is not currently open. So that is a false narrative. It was open, people were applying, it is off now. I don't know, I never received a notice that it was off. Um, I'm just hearing it from people, you know, as we go around and get people the information stating, hey, they're not accepting money. They're not accepting applications anymore. So those are just a few things that I want to hit on when I'm talking about this. So the purpose of this legislation is because the community acts for it. Right? The community is suffering. People who so can't point, point get on the Zoom call is who I'm speaking Please. for. The people who water is shut off, not because they don't want to pay it, not because they're lazy, not because the city just wants their money. No, they don't have the money to do it. They just don't have it. We're in the middle of a pandemic on top of that. Outside, forget everything else was going on. We're on top of a pandemic at that, where it's hard for certain people to find work or go up, go out to work, where things are really hard for some people in this city. And we're not thinking about those people. The mor moratorium is for six months, right? And we have, so we have funding to cover. We have ARPA funds. We have federal money. We have money. We have the money to cover a six-month moratorium to be able to, one, maybe come up with a better system um, for long-term water bills. Um, it, it may have improved, but there's a lot of things we can do to revamp it and to make it um, more affordable for low-income people and to find ways to get people back on track. That's what we can do within those six months when we have this moratorium. And we cannot say that there's no funding. We have ARPA. We have $55 million. And I believe 12 million of that is going to revenue loss. So when we talk about revenue loss, I don't know if that applies to the water bill, but we said we lost $5 million. So where's our 12 million revenue loss going to? So that's another question someone probably can address. So I'm gonna end with that because I have some closing statements and some things, but I really wanna hear from other um, council people and from the community. Um, so I'm gonna end it right here. Okay, um, this, this is by, this is uh, Chairman Johnson. Uh, I guess my first question, and, and thank you very much, Councilmember Darby, um, is really a question for law department. Um, I, I don't see a resulting budget ordinance, and you know, part of my job is to try to make sure our, our, our council's job is to make sure the budget is balanced. So um, I'm a little concerned about there not being a budget ordinance attached to this. Can someone from law department chime in about just a just the legal a aspects of this at all? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Ch Mr. Chair. Um, so the law department in reviewing this legislation, uh, we came to the, the, the conclusion that if council were to pass the ordinance without passing another ordinance containing revenue, revenue measures to offset the re any decrease um, by the water moratorium ordinance, um, it would create an unbalanced fiscal 2022 annual operating budget. And that would be a violation of the city charter section 2-302. Um, it requires council, so charter section 2-302 requires council to ordain uh, revenues measures <clears throat> that will, in the opinion of the administration, yield sufficient revenue to balance the annual operating budget um, so in short, their council is not allowed by charter to pass an ordinance which would reduce, you know, which would kind of result in an imbalanced budget without passing a, another measure to offset that imbalance, the, the decrease in revenue. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hawley. 
Um, and I guess that leads me to the prime sponsor. Um, uh, certainly, uh, just uh, as a point of question, is uh, if this is to pass, uh, where specifically? I understand that we've talked about ARPA. Um, as you know, there's many restrictions to that. Um, can we can we point out a way that this can actually get paid for, like in terms of a budget ordinance, like budget lines, um, not just you know in a broad spectrum, but actually where can we get the money from? Yeah, I don't have the exact budget lines with me, right? Um, so I think that's a conversation we can have, but I don't have the exact budget line number. Okay, thank you very much. I have no further questions. I just had that, you know, kind of the tactical question, but I would open up to uh, fellow members of council. And prior to us going in with the uh, prime sponsor, there was uh, council member McCoy had her hand raised. I apologize, council member. Oh, um, that's fine. Um, I had took it down uh, because uh, oh. uh, Councilman Darby actually had touched on something I had wanted to speak about, but I did think of something else. So this is not really um, more so a question, but a statement. Um, some of the things that uh, she had touched on are things that I had uh, previously had looked at. Uh, the water issue has been something that's been close to my heart for some time. Um, a moratorium was something I had basically set my eyes on, but then had reconsidered only because at the time we, um, the mayor had decided that he was going to do a moratorium because at that time frame COVID came. Um, so, but some of the things that I really wanted uh, our uh, director of finance to really take a closer look at, he had been doing so, uh, but there's still so much more to do. Um, when I think of the fact that we are doing the, um, the uh, the water, uh, when people are calling and asking for these uh, payment uh, plans or such, you know, I think that we need to take into consideration these um, term limits. I think that uh, the amount that they're asking to turn on when it comes to, to get the water back on, I think there's an absorbent amount. And I think that it, it wouldn't have to be such if we actually extended the time frame that we allow them to actually get that, that payment, um, like those payments uh, completed. I think if we trying to keep it at 36 months or whatever, or something to that 48, I mean, well, not 36, but like 24, 36 months, something like that. I think we may have to stretch out a little longer because if we're still paying on this on a monthly basis, plus paying a back bill, that can be, and with the bill actually being, um, you know, we've been stated that it's 93. I believe 93 is basically what they're considering like the median, but um, yeah, our, everybody's bills definitely is different. I'm like, my bill is a little less because I have a smaller family, so. Um, but that and also the whole um, utility uh, assistance, that whole, uh, the utility assistance program, I had, you know, I know that Councilwoman Darby promoted it. I know I promoted it. I know I ended up on that uh, low income. I don't even know how I got invited to that thing yesterday, but I was on that low income of water assistance program Zoom call and got a chance to ask some questions because as I was talking to director um, Taylor, like we definitely, everything I was kind of suggesting, he was working with me and I have to give him, his, uh, you know, I have to really applaud him for that because the guidelines increased, you know, the age went down, you know, so that, the, you know, younger people could apply, they could make a little bit more money, all those different things. And even with the replenishment, but now we come to find out that, uh, it's been replenished, but the people don't have access to it. They, they're unable to fill out um, application. That is concerning to me because I was still promoting it because I wanted to make certain that everyone, I'm getting phone calls as well. And they're not really from my district, uh, you know, funny thing is, but I'm still getting phone calls. I'm still trying to, you know, direct people to where they need to go. And I really wanted to make certain that the applications are being received. And if they aren't, that there's someone is still guiding them and basically not just telling them, oh, we can't right now. Like it has to be another conversation that has to happen in order not to um, discourage people from calling the 311. So I just wanted to make certain that that information, uh, that I got a chance to speak because this is still something that um, really needs to be uh, addressed. I don't want to, um, I don't want to see people not have their water on um, at the same time, I do understand what the, the dilemma is about being in more debt uh, once a moratorium is over. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm already seeing that with family members, so. 
Thank you very much, Council Member. And uh, as a point of clarity, Director or Chief of Staff Washington, can you clarify this, uh, the portal being closed? I know that's been mentioned at various points tonight. Can you mention whether the assistance program is, is open or is it temporarily shut down? It, is, it, it, is, it is still open. Okay. Mm -hmm. The utility assistance program has a, uh, approximately $100,000 left. Um, I will check with IT to make sure that the portal is still there, but they can still go ahead and call 311 and connect with the agent. Just ask for account services, utility assistance payment program. Okay. okay. All right. Now, Chairman Johnson, I'm sorry. Yeah. There was one other thing I wanted to say because it was a salient point that was brought up earlier regarding our budget and the fact that the budget is imbalanced. Just like any business, the revenues that come from water billing supports the operation, the cleaning of the water, and our capital infrastructure improvements to the water system. So, and when you're talking about operations, you very well are talking about positions in the water department. So. A, a loss of revenue impacts us on a lot of different levels. First of all, we want to have clean water. We want to continue to do that. So this 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 uh, this whole notion that um, the the us not receiving the funding for to support our revenue division is absolutely absurd. We have to continue to be responsible and fiduciary responsible for this water system. It's just it's just a practical matter. Thank you very much, Chief of Staff. Uh, now I'm going to turn it back to members of Council. I believe there's some, a few more questions. Uh, Council Member Walsh, you're, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Um, the Director just a answered my first question about whether or not the program was uh, still in play or if it was just rumors on the street that it wasn't. And the second thing is, I just don't see any way out of it. You need a fiscal note for us to vote on this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have to do that. So what are we going to do, ignore the elephant in the room? You know, the tougher subject becomes doesn't mean that the laws change in between just because. Excuse me, point of order, come on, it, it, it's a place of business, okay? Um, and again, if it, we have simple rules, if, if you can't comport yourself, uh, you will be asked to leave, okay? Um, so we want to keep this meeting on track, we have a lot more comments to go. So uh, we have Council Member Spadola, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> uh, when I'm evaluating any piece of legislation, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't look at the good intent of the author. I look at the incentives that it creates for people. And, uh, you know, this would incentivize people to not pay their water. And we, we already have proof of that. If you look at the effects of the, the previous moratorium, um, one thing that hasn't been brought up is council was provided lists of people whose water um, reached very high bills. And after the moratorium ended, people that weren't paying uh, were getting the notices. There's a lot of people people that we all know that were on that list that are of means and had the ability to pay, but took advantage of the city offering them an interest-free loan, essentially. So we all can sympathize with the people um, that are unable to pay, and the city is clearly bending over backwards for them. Um, all people need to do is respond to the notice, and uh, they can prevent their water from getting cut off. So um, in addition to the the negative incentives this creates and the, the fact that it might be illegal, I am not going to support this. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, is there anybody else first round of committee members or first round of council members? Okay. Um, so now we're going to turn to the second round um, of, of council members before we go to the, the public. Okay. Um, so council member Darby, I do believe you had your hand raised first yes yes so I'm on the website it says currently unfortunately the utility assistance program has exhausted funding at this time okay so the program is not accepted applications right now and there are no people who are um, who can apply so I just want to make that very clear um, and also 
I'll, I'll address other things in my closing comments, but people are not paying their water bill just be, not because they don't have that they don't want to pay it. The majority of people are not paying their water bill because they don't have the funding. So we're not going to draw this narrative that people are taking advantage of a system. They're not taking advantage of it. The, I have been at the door speaking to these people. So that's what I'm going to end off with until it's time for closing calls. And I would love for the public to be able to make comments. Understood, Council Member. Uh, do you have a point of clarity, Director? Yes. This is an IT. I mean, I'm, I'm not on the website myself, but I it's an it IT. It, it, it's not an IT issue. We had exhausted $300,000 of the original CARES Act money. We put a notice up there saying that it it was exhausted. We've then got $150,000 more. We have to make the change to the website. The website's incorrect. That's all. Okay, so it is an open program. So, no, no, excuse me, point of order, we'll, we'll, we'll open it to the public soon. I just wanted the information to be correct for the public. We will correct it in the morning. As folks that are watching from home, okay, so it is active. The website's not great. Again, I think we've had this conversation about communication. Um, I think we, we've talked about that previously. So the website will be updated as soon as possible, correct, Director? Mm -hmm. Correct. Like, like tomorrow, hopefully. Like, <laughs> uh, like tonight. Like the minute okay. I get off. I'm sending right. a message now. All right, yeah, so tonight. I just wanted to clear that up. And um, we have first round of comments on council. Um, well, we, we second round before we go to public. Council member Fields, uh, this is your first time. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. My question is, um, since, since you said it's not up to like right now, um, and it may not, I mean, because it's a, it might be an IT issue or it might be a web issue, can, um, can the individuals, those that's in need, can they still call the 311 number and still apply, even though it's not on a website? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, no, that, that was the question to you. Uh, Council, Council Member Darby, we, we have to go in order. I'm still talking, right? Is it still yeah, my turn? Yeah, Council, Council Member feels the floor is still yours, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can I get an answer for that, please? Yes. The Yes, people oh, okay. can so still yes. apply for the okay. utility assistance. I just want to make sure that when mm -hmm. I relay this information to people that, you know, even though it's not up there and they, you know, they say it's not up there, we can, they can still call. All right. Um, and uh, that's about it. That's all I have right thank, now. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Council Member. Council Mr. Member, Chair. We're going for second round again. Council Member Oliver, leave your Thank up. you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, as we were speaking, I received two phone calls. Um, individuals who are listening at the, on the zoom she stated that the web uh the website uh she did see the message in reference to the money i guess some time ago but she called today the 311 and they were able to help her so as you stated you know um you may be on the telephone with the delmar with the telephone company for a while and they may call you back etc but the 311 is still in effect and it's money there because i have a young lady that's on here to just text me and they helped her today with her water bill because she called me early so I was asking her did she get help and she Good. said the web this web page wasn't accurate um, but I called 311 and I was able to make payment arrangements thank you so much mm -hmm. so for everyone that's listening 311 is and he's just stated I mean even if it's an error but at least we know it's a hundred thousand dollars in there I mean I know I've been sending people I've been calling people telling them do I even pulled up the 96 hour disconnect for the third district. I mean, just to look at the addresses, made a copy and said, look, feel free to call 311 because it's funding available. Um, also, I want to make a statement that when, um, based on the water bill, I'm going to be honest, that was the last thing I played until I received the yellow slip. I didn't even pay, the, I mean, the water bill wasn't that important to me until I received the disconnect notice. And I think it's like that in many cases, in many people's homes. That's the last thing, the water bill is not my priority. Well, it wasn't a priority in my household. Mm -hmm. That would be the last bill I paid. I paid it when I received a yellow slip. And unfortunately, I think sometimes it just catches up with people. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I want to be honest about that. But I want to go back to the public and let everybody know that you get a you get bill number one, you get bill number two, you get a direct letter, 
you receive a six, 96 hour notice, which is four days. And a lot of people can't afford it. I mean, I have a niece that have three kids. I mean, she can't afford it. But what she did is made a payment arrangement. And I think that's the part that we're missing because I'm here and I want the public to know I'm here for the people. I talk to the women and the men who work in the water department who don't want to be laid off. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, campaign for the people who've been here for 30, 40 years who I don't want to see them lose their job opposed to individuals such as my niece that can make payment arrangements. So with that being said, I won't support this bill tonight. All right, Vice, Vice Chair Harley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, first of all, I want to say that I certainly believe that anyone that's having a hardship paying their water bill deserves to get support. With the information that has been shared tonight, it's clear that there is help if you are having a hardship. But what is not clear to me after listening to the conversations going back and forth, which I think needs to be uh, exhausted, is that we need the people that are having an issue to call either 311, if they can't get 311, to call a city council representative. The help is here. Clearly, we heard that loud and clear tonight. Secondly, if a person can't just don't have the money, that's a whole nother issue if you just don't have the money. So tonight, I really do believe that we, the city of Wilmington has made it clear that we are here to support our residents and we most certainly support those that are having a hardship and we want them to contact us because we don't, we don't know who we're talking about. And for us to put a moratorium on disconnecting everybody's water, and we're only talking about five or 10 or 15 people, we are not positioning our residents to really be accountable and responsible because six months from now, what's gonna change? Six months from now, what's gonna be different? So I'm in support of helping and supporting anyone that's having a hardship, but I'm in support of them reaching out, making arrangements, and working with the city. I personally know someone that doesn't pay their water bill because they have not found a job that they wanted. Not that they can't find a job, but because they haven't found the job that they wanted, of course their bills are backed up, they can't pay their water bill, and I will be perfectly honest with you, they pay $5 a month. When they told me that they pay $5 a month, I was like, wow, I didn't even realize that the city would accept $5 a month. So if someone is really having a hardship and they really don't have the money, there's proof that the city of Wilmington will work with you if you just don't have the money. So again, I feel as though it is our judicial responsibility to not only support our residents, when, when they're having a hardship and that there's a need, but we also have a responsibility to make sure that we have a balanced budget to make sure that the city can run and maintain, salaries can be paid, and there is a win-win for our citizens, our taxpayers, and that there is a win-win for the city of Wilmington. And I'm just gonna say this and I'll be done. We need to always look at the full picture as it relates to economics. I heard uh, someone say that we have the money for this, we have the money for that. This is a one-time deal with the ARPS money. That money is being decided on as it relates to other issues that are going on within our city. So again, if we work the plan that has already been put in place for, for those that have a hardship, that's what I am in support of. I do not want to see six months from now someone that got their water, they didn't have to pay their water bill, and in six months they're in the same position. So I'm in support of supporting those that have a hardship, but we want them to call the city of Wilmington. If they can't get the finance department, please give them my phone number, and I feel as though all of my council colleagues are in support of them calling us because we don't know who these people are. And, and, and I, I personally want to know who they are, and if they really are having a hard time, 
then give them our number and let them work with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very much, and I would like to uh, recognize Council Member Field from the 8th District. He's on the line as well. Um, and before we open it to members of the public, uh, and, and, and I sit here and think about all the arguments tonight, I do have a fair question, Director Taylor. Is, um, is there a way that the Finance Department distinguishes uh, multi-unit dwellings from um, single-family homes? Um, because they, I think the question about renters, um, I think, is a salient point. There, and I know it came with um, even uh, rental assistance with the state where renters want to apply for the state program, but yet their landlord won't sign on. Is there a workaround for that? Because that is, I, I think, a, a very valid concern that <coughs> renters may be subject to it um, and not be able to apply because their landlord is a slumlord. A couple observations. One is, I think that there is a point to having some policy discussion about uh, landlords and renters in terms of the water bill. It, a lot of it, it's a mix. One of the things, sometimes you have an owner of a rental facility that will have the, the renter be responsible for the water bill, whereas you have a whole another, an, you know, an equally sized rental facility, but the owner pays it through the rents that are collected. So there's no universal approach to having to how landlords collect this water rent. With that said, um, in some cases, we are looking at these large, and uh, when we look at our accounts receivable, we start with the largest sellers. And a lot of those are condominium units and, and rental facilities that have outstanding balances, and we reach out to them and say, are you collecting rents from your, are you collecting water utility fees from your renters, or are you having the renters pay them directly? So we're really trying to tease that out a little bit. The other observation is, under the, you are correct, under the utility assistance program, it was only given out to those who own their properties. Uh, if they met the income eligible guidelines. And that was by design because we had a very small pool of money that would have gone out. However, I will say that under the low income housing water, household water assistance program, it applies to renters as well. So this new program that's coming out by the state in which we're gonna be partnering with the state, that money is gonna be available for, um, for renters who may be have the uh, water bill uh, as their obligation. So we're looking forward to having yet another stream of revenue that we can tap into, that we can direct these people who are in hardship over to, and it will cover renters. All right, well, thank you very much, Director. And again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I sit, sit tight as, as we do have some members of the public signed up uh, for public comments. So uh, as we've been doing this hybrid format, We'll start with our, those who are, have joined us here in person. Um, they're taking the time out of their day. We'll have them first, and then we'll go with the uh, virtual uh, members of the public as well. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to go in order of who is listed tonight. This is, again, the order that I have. Okay. We have, uh, and it's, again, same ground rules as always. Um, we're going to be a, a three-minute uh, limit. Okay. All right, so first I would like to call Ms. Christian Willauer. I believe, I believe the podium is yours. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Council um, <coughs> and Finance Committee, for giving me the chance to speak. Um, it, it, I just want to say, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. And I, um, my name is Christian Willauer. I'm a resident of the city of Wilmington. And I really do think that a moratorium is a really important step that the city should take. Not because um, the, the, anybody wants the city to go broke, but because we're in the middle of a pandemic, people need access to water, and that there are tons of resources. I mean, our elected officials in Washington have done an amazing job in responding to the pandemic and making resources available for people who are suffering because of the pandemic, and that includes people who've gotten behind on their water bills. So, you know, there is funding through um, 
ARPA, there's funding through LIHEAP, there's funding through, I mean, LIWAP, there's funding through um, DHAP. And DHAP has, you know, over $200 million for renters, which renters can apply for, and they can get assistance for back rent and utility payments back through 2020. So a lot of that money could potentially go to, to pay some of these back utility bills for these renters that have gotten behind. I mean, we heard tonight that a lot of these delinquencies have happened in 2020 and 2021, which is when the pandemic happened, which is when that DHAP money is available to pay for these kinds of things. And we all know, we've all heard in the news, there's a delay in getting out the DHAP money, mostly because of operational issues, but not because the resources aren't there. So the purpose of having a moratorium at this time is to give time for that money to flow from the DHAP program, from that $130 million in DHAP, to potentially cover the back utilities for these people who've gotten behind in their utility payments during the pandemic. It just makes sense to keep the water on and use the resources that have been made available by the federal government and if the issue is time, let's not turn off people's water while help is here. So that's the big point that I wanted to make. And the second thing is, is just, you know, there's been a lot of talk tonight about the impact on the budget. And I do see that, you know, it seems like one of the biggest reasons not to do the moratorium is financial. Mm -hmm. And that there's this idea that it might cost the city something not to, um, to have a moratorium. And I did notice in the fiscal year 2020 um, budget, that there's critical assumptions that are listed. And one of them is, it talks about critical assumptions for the water sewer fund for fiscal year 2022. And this is from the city of Wilmington budget. It says, excluding year end accruals, which can vary significantly from year to year, FY 2021 appears to be consistent with prior years with limited net impacts from COVID. And then it goes on a little bit later. It says, finally, the projection includes a greater than $1.9 million offset for a bad debt an improvement of almost 2.1 million from FY 2021's budgeted bad debt of over 4 million. For the FY 2021 budget, the city has had used a bad debt rate of 7.5%, conservatively assuming that COVID would heavily impact collections. As this largely has not occurred in FY 2021, for FY 2022, we've chosen to use a bad debt rate of 3% for direct user fees. So it just seems like the the impact of have the financial impact of having a moratorium could be minimal and yet it could have a major impact on the the like the access to water for Wilmington residents who we thank all need much, Ms. no need, we need access to water. Time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, Mr. Jerry Crespo, are you speaking in regard to this bill? Um, no. Okay. This is only in regard to this bill. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Pat Trice, and no, Sarah Green, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, uh, for giving us this time. My name is Sarah Green. I'm a city resident. I'm also the executive director of Pacham and Terrace. And I've listened a lot tonight, and I've listened to um, the reasoning about the financial status of our city. Um, and I want to just give you an example, because I am a highly educated, very capable woman. And when the pandemic hit, my husband and I both lost our jobs. And guess what? I called 311, and I tried to get that utilities assistance. Me, highly educated, I don't know how many phone calls I had to do, but finally I gave up because it was so hard. So I've heard you talking about all that you're doing and I appreciate all that the city is doing, I do. But what I wanna tell you is not everyone in the city is as highly educated and capable as I am. Not everyone has the time to put in just to get this assistance that we're talking about is so easy to get. And I wanna remind you that when we're talking about this assistance, we're talking about American Rescue Plan funds but this isn't rescuing anyone, it's just putting their debt further along in the years. It's not taking away the debt. If we put a moratorium, then the city can take that time to figure out where that money can come from to absolutely, actually forgive some of that debt so that when people are struggling with hardships, they actually have a chance to come back from it as opposed to 
having to continue to pay it, continue to pay it, continue to pay it, and just get further, further back. The second thing I want to say is I've heard, um, I, I'm pretty shocked, but it sounds like um, we're being threatened. It sounds like you're threatening the safety of our water and jobs based on something that's the city's job to provide is water. I mean, you're talking about numbers. You say only 105 families continue to be shut off. What if you were one of those families? I mean, we're talking about running water. We live in the United States. Like, I understand that we're all about bottom line and we have to make the budget even. Mm -hmm. I do understand. I run a nonprofit. I have run multiple nonprofits. I understand how money works, but I also understand that we're human beings and we deserve that dignity in the middle of a pandemic that requires clean water. And I don't believe that we should have to worry about the, this, the, the cleanliness of our water if we're gonna look out for our, our neighbors whose water is being shut off. That is all I have to say. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a uh, Mr. Uh, Brandon Fletcher. Put him is yours, sir. Thank you, uh, Chair Johnson, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Brandon Fletcher, and I'm a Homes Campaign Coordinator. Um, I've been leading canvases across all eight councilmanic districts in the city of Wilmington, giving residents resources about where they can get help paying for their water bills. And in that process, we are speaking to people who don't have water, people who are at risk of getting their water shut off. They are told to contact the utility payment assistance program, and they're being told that there's no money there and it has exhausted funding. So the argument that there's money there is not true because people are calling, they're visiting the website, and it says that the funding has been exhausted. We have collected over 200 petition signatures. Um, just to note, that's a slightly more than some of the votes that these council members have won their primary elections by, and we're prepared to mobilize against council members who don't address the needs of their constituents, access to water during a pandemic, to support this moratorium on water service disconnections. COVID-19 has had an enormous impact on so many and for many low income families in the city of Wilmington, this has destabilized their ability to pay rent and mortgages and to hold off a wave of evictions, the federal government mandated a stay of eviction to prevent landlords from evicting, ten evicting tenants. That has been lifted. Eviction moratorium is no longer in place and many Wilmington residents who are still at risk of, result, uh, of, risk of eviction due to the pandemic are no longer protected. Just imagine coming home from work, you go to get a glass of water, but you turn on the faucet and nothing comes out, or you need to wash your hands to stay, stay, to stay safe from COVID, or even clean dishes. There is a man in Hilltop who is sharing a hose from a neighbor because he does not have water. He contacted Catholic Charities. They were gonna send the city $600, but the city refused the money because they want $1,700. So what are we going to do about the people who don't have water right now, who have children that are at risk of being taken away, who can't clean themselves, who can't keep themselves safe from COVID? The mayor is constantly releasing statements saying to stay safe due to COVID. How can you stay safe if you don't have water? Water is a human right. Housing is a human right. And if you don't have water, you don't have housing because you are at risk of eviction or you are at risk of getting your home foreclosed. Now, I ask the council to consider using the funding that you all, the Finance Committee, on May 25th, 2021, put together a PowerPoint, the regulation and guidance for the American Rescue Plan Act that says right here, the city is entitled to receive $55 million to respond to the public health emergency or its negative impacts, economic impacts, including assistance to households, including assistance to households. Use this money to keep the water on and use the six month moratorium to be creative in your solutions, to get the money out to people. You're saying to give people to call? 
why not go to them? People don't know numbers. People need their council members to go to them. That is all I have to say. Please support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you yeah, please, again, as a point of order, we have a lot of members to go through. So uh, again, uh, we, we want to keep it tight so we can get everyone up. I believe we have a uh, Lewis and Helen Furman. Are you both speaking individually or as a couple? or? Well, I guess I'll look back here for him to help me anyway. Okay. Um, Podium is yours. I have a quick question, sir. I uh, ma'am, ma'am, but a public comment, you can't unfortunately ask him ask a question. Questions. No, unfortunately, council. I think can't. he, I think his PowerPoint said something like 11,000 so many accounts are in arrears, and something about 23 million. And my my concern is is that 11,000 times 93 dollars is not 23 million. Okay, it's a uh, more like uh, one point something million. So I wondered about the re financial report he gave. In the ARP mentioned by Brandon, there are four specific guidelines for the use of the 55 million. And I noticed, Michelle, you said that some of the money has been allocated to other things already, if I heard you correctly. And I apologize if I didn't. Some of it. Um, I just want to mention what Mayor Perzicki said at his own neighborhood association uh, called the Highlands Community Association, HCA. He said that, of course, it's all pity, pity those who lose their water and all that, but that out of that 55 million, loans would be made and grants would be offered for home improvement. And lending, which is a, what banks do, is for the purpose of making money based on interest. That's how they earn revenue. Um, I didn't read anywhere in the ARP anything about uh, fixing up houses. Now, Nobody more than me would like to see some houses fixed up in my neighborhood where I pay taxes and I pay my water bills. But if that money from the federal government has been earmarked, then you could be audited if you fail to follow the guidelines. And this has happened before in the city for the facade program. That was for the purpose of fixing up houses. I did some research on that facade program. A lot of money went missing. A lot of repairs created more damage than they offered repairs. And uh, money was missing during the last term. Uh, Belda Potter uh, pointed it out. And so this, this 55 million, and we hear about, oh, this is going here and there. Well, we better start looking at those line items. And uh, I'm not so sure that uh, the city should be so worried about raising taxes if people keep their water on. Because if you follow the federal money that's been offered, okay, the tax is covered. The money's covered. That's what that 55 million is for. It's for water. Um, one more thing is when somebody's water is shut off, and I know this personally, firsthand experience, believe me, you don't get to stay in your house. The first thing that happens, the water goes off and L and I puts you out. Happened in my neighborhood, simple as that. You cannot stay in a house without running water. So Thank you very much, ma'am. For those we, 100 we people, that have had their water shut off, they've been kicked out, even whether it's a landlord's fault or whose fault it is. And as a landlady, I know who get, who is on yeah. the hook to pay the water okay, bill. Okay, thank you very much. And it's not the tenant. Thank you very much, Ms. Furman. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, 
Uh, we have a uh, Richard Smith. Podium is yours, sir. Chair Johnson and Council Folk. I'm here with the NWCP. I think what you're all doing is wrong to the people. You've been doing it since John Babbiard, Mayor McLaughlin, Jim Baker, Dennis Williams, and now this mayor. It always come to the water, water and sewer. Every year, every time they want to do a budget, they can't find money, they go to water and sewer. Then they put penalties inside of it. Penalties that say, I want a three point penalty, a two point penalty, plus a hundred dollars. If you, it's a, it's a penalty in the bill that every time you don't pay your bill, you'll penalize a hundred dollars. In 12 months, you owe $1,200 when you got a bill for a hundred and some dollars. The average bill is $33 a month, I know because I didn't pay my bill because of the penalty. My bill is not $934. I gave him $534 a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know nothing about no program. Nobody came to my house. I didn't know nothing about nothing. I called, I called the, uh, the finance 25 times, didn't get an answer. I finally got an answer and I went on to a program. My bill is going to be paid next month. I did that because I did it for the people who couldn't afford to pay $100, couldn't afford to keep their word on. This is about people. This has been going on for over 50 years. I started, I started with city council at 10 years old, protesting with Hicks Hansen and stuff. Now we still talk about the water bill. People can't, like they say, people cannot take a bath, people cannot Watch the kids, people cannot cook without water. LRI put you out, okay? You got 134 people that's old. I bet you out of the 134 people, 90% of them is black folks. Yeah. It's all about black people in this city. Black people are getting penalized out of this city. I think what the NWCP is going to do is get with the ACLU and other groups and put a class action suit in. It's time for suits, y'all. It's time to begin to fight back. We, we got politicians we put in, some good, some bad, some working, some doing this. But I know you're supposed to do the responsibility of making the city whole. But you can't leave the people out there. Mm. And I ain't talking nothing, y'all. I'm talking Joan saying it's time for a suit. Brendan, the NWCB done met up with you. Everybody else, get, get your... Get your petitions gone, and the end of the city will find a way to sue. Because what's going on now is not right for the people. The poorest people in, in this city is on the east side, west side, the fourth and stuff, that can't afford to pay. The bill is $34, which is, ain't that much, but the penalties, the penalties mm -hmm. stop a person from from paying the bill. So if council wanted to look at something, look at the penalties. Thank you, and again, we will talk later. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, is there anyone else here in chambers that wishes to speak in regards to this piece of legislation? All right. Uh, now I'm gonna turn it to members of the public. Uh, we have Michelena De Jesus. The floor is yours. Hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so a lot of this stuff was already said. Um, I did want to echo Shanae, Christian, Brandon. Um, in the beginning, you know, the pandemic issue was not brought up. Um, um, Councilman Johnson, you know, as you regulate the room, and that you all sit there with masks on, you know, it just kind of sits different for me as I, you know, deal with people who are affected by the water shut off. As you try to maintain and regulate that room, yet there are some people who come home and can't wash their hands. So it's just, it's, it's unsettling. Um, so let's see. So I did want to bring up the pandemic. I want to echo that. 
um, when I hear all these resources, that's not, it's not really, um, it sounds nice, um, but that's not what it is. Um, even this neighbor that Brandon talked about um, is my neighbor. Um, they were using my water. Um, and uh, we did reach out to a couple. We've sat with a couple people to try to get that or those funds and stuff for them, whether the website was not accepting applications or, or whatever the case may be. Um, happily, their water will be turned back on, although it will not be to assistance that was provided to them. There was a loan taken out. Um, they did have a rather high bill. Both of the people that live in that house are disabled. Both of them um, do not have the same work uh, or can work, <laughs> can even work as much as they used to, um, especially since this past June. Um, so yeah, uh, they wanted three thousand um, dollars. Happily, their water will be on, um, but that's just these resources that we hear about. It's just like you know, I would like to know what three one one does to um, get them access that you know that they're missing through maybe the DE COVID help or whatever we can do to get those people um, those resources. So I'm going to ask you guys to consider. Um, I don't know how to say the word, I guess the extension I'm going to say, um, for the reasons that uh, Christian was saying, um, it's not about, uh, you know, gathering that debt, but like the, the operational portion of it, if there, the funds are there, what are we doing um, to make sure that they're receiving those funds? Like, for example, for my neighbors, okay, you sent out all of these bills, one, two, and three, all of these letters, for whatever reason, it's not being paid. But before turning the water off in a pandemic that should not be allowed, maybe even having or partnering with organizations to then set out to that home to find out, are these out-of-state landlords? Is this a disabled person in their house? What is the situation so we can help get you those resources um, before your water is actually turned off? Um, I know I only got a couple seconds left, but before you guys close out, I, I'm going to ask if you can ask to get some clarification on this recent water contamination. Um, I heard that it was on north side i'll be quick i heard that it was um mostly north side residents that was affected although there is one resident that i know of on uh second and Connell that received a notice of water contamination and i am further on top of the hill i did not receive a notice although um my uh my water had a stench to it and i don't know if that's piping issues within my own home or if my water um was contaminated um so i would just uh, i'm looking for some further clarification on that as well thank you okay. um, we will work to get that, that those questions addressed by by the administration thank you um, next up is Christina K floor is yours hello can you hear me yes we can all right awesome thank you so much council uh, and Mr. Chair, uh, for an opportunity to speak, I'm Christina Kelly. Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, obviously I agree with Christian and Brandon. Um, I do like that Christian was able to point out directly in your budget um, that you do have the funding for this and that there's really no logical reason why we are sitting here arguing over whether or not somebody deserves to have running water in their house, especially in the middle of the pandemic. Um, honestly, it's kind of disgusting. Um, this is disheartening to even hear that this is happening right now um, and that we're treating water as if it were a luxury. Um, I, we're, we're talking about water right now. We're, we're talking about water. We're talking about something that is essential to keeping people healthy, keeping people safe, and keeping them in their homes. Uh, but I think it's more important to know that you know, we, we continue talking about funding and, and what funding is or is not available. So outside of the $55 million you guys were granted for utility assistance uh, purposes, you know, we also just signed argued um, all through the month of August and September and October about, you know, $100,000 for new police uniforms and more funding for police drones and more funding for scooters and bikes for police officers in the city. So maybe instead of, you know, trying to get all of these new toys for the cops to play with, maybe we can start worrying about people having basic necessities in their homes available for them and their children. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next up, we have Ms. Uh, 
uh, Lauren, Lauren Bales. Hi everyone, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. My name is Dr. Lauren Bales. I'm a resident of the 5th District. I wanna thank you all for letting me speak tonight. I'll start by saying many of the points that I plan to make have already been made by other members of the Holmes team who are here this evening. As an aside, I'll add that Brandon mentioned the canvassing that the Holmes campaign has been doing. I have personally entered the data for about 120 surveys that the Holmes campaign has collected from those door-to-door -door campaigns. I don't have the precise descriptive data, but I estimate that about half of those have experienced or are experiencing evictions and approximately three quarters of those are due to owed utility bills, including water. There are nearly 7,200 Wilmington households who live on less than $19,000 a year, although the annual residential water bill in Wilmington is over $1,000 per year. That means for our most vulnerable families in the city, more than $1 out of every 20 in the household goes to water each year. Water is a human right and everyone should have access to clean water. This is true under normal circumstances, but as many commenters have said, we are not living in normal circumstances. Water is an essential part of giving people the tools they need to wash their hands, clean themselves in their homes and fight the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Yet we clearly have a water affordability crisis in Wilmington. Since 2002, water bills in Wilmington have more than tripled and water bills in the city often exceed 3% of household incomes, which is the United Nations recommended limit for affordable water. As water has become more unaffordable, renters continue to be evicted due to unpaid water bills or shut off water. No one should have their water shut off during a pandemic. I'm asking the members of this, this committee and the council to adopt the short and long-term policies suggested by the Homes Campaign, including replenishing funding to the Utility Payment Assistance Program, and I'll add to that, addressing any technical difficulties that are proving a barrier to access. Support a six-month moratorium on the water shutoffs. Support a moratorium on water bill foreclosures. Use the moratoria to help residents and the city maximize access to DHAP, as has also been mentioned tonight, the LEWAP and the ARP money to address the owed balances. These are just some of the ways we can be good neighbors and caring members of the city to our vulnerable neighbors, especially during the holiday season and especially during an ongoing pandemic. Thank you for your consideration. Very much. Uh, we have a uh, Cheyenne Miller. Floor is yours. Uh, we we can't hear you. Was that uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so my name is Cheyenne Miller. I am with the Homes Campaign, and I'm also a resident in. District 7 on west side of Wilmington. I'm here to give public comment on uh, the proposal for a moratorium on water bills, shut off. And I just want to say we are in support of the moratorium. It is a tragedy to be seeing so many people who do not have access to water during a pandemic as this committee doesn't allow for residents to come in and sit down and partake in the committee because they claim the pandemic is is the reasoning they have to do social distancing. They are also having people saying that they don't wanna support having access to water. And this is just disappointing. A lot of renters do not have their water bill in their name and yet are paying their landlords for their water bills. And those renters are getting their water cut off when the bills don't get paid by the landlord. So they're sitting in homes where the home is no longer habitable and they're unable to get their water turned back on because it's not in their name. These are the types of issues we're having. It's also important to recognize that many of the residents in the city who do call, including myself, I've called to see, does 311 give you access to water bills? And they are not. The utility assistance payment program is not on. It is not on if you call. And the only option you are given is to start a payment plan, which many people cannot do because they don't have access to money. 
Furthermore, the utility assistance payment program is only available to someone who is a homeowner. Again, we live in a city full of renters. Many of those renters cannot afford to, to have water put in their name or don't have the ability to put the water in their name because they don't own the property, excuse me. And so how are they going to be able to access that program? They can't. And their landlord's not paying the bill. And many people can barely get a hold of their landlords as is, as they're out of state. And so it is disappointing to hear so many people on this committee, so many city council members who are expressing that they feel as though the city is doing enough. When we know that during a pandemic, if the city is enforcing rules like social distancing, that they should also be considering not turning off people's water. And so I do hope that all the city council members sitting on this committee and all of the city council members that are simply attending this committee will consider it. And furthermore, on this committee, the agenda also has a point on here for the finance committee to discuss the American Rescue Plan funds. If the, the agenda includes that, why can't part of that discussion be making up for the revenue shortfall that would happen with this, with this ordinance through those funds? There is no reason for us to be saying we don't have enough money when also on this agenda is for people to be able to have a say on what the American Rescue Plan funds are going to be used for. That is my public comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Um, next up, we have a Zanetta 216. We can't hear you. WITN, I think we, they're having some technical difficulties, uh, so we may need to move through and allow them to speak later. All right, well, uh, Zanetta, we can't hear you, so uh, if you can maybe sign off and sign back in, we'll give you the opportunity to speak, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it may be your microphone. All right, um, are there any other? Just yes. Just yes, want to um, uh, communicate to the committee that the website has been changed. It's been corrected. So if anybody's looking for you to um, access the, the utility assistance program, they can call 311, and we'll make whatever additional corrections we need to tomorrow on the website. Can you repeat that, Tana? I couldn't hear you. I was just saying that the website has been changed to say call 311 if they need assistance with utility billing. And whatever other changes we need to make, we'll do it tomorrow. But it's been changed as of now. Sure. All right, thank you very much, Chief of Staff. Um, last call for members of the public who are online. So now I see your hand raised, but we still can't hear you. So uh, with that, I would then turn it back to members of council. Um, Councilmember Darby, you, you are the sponsor, so I'll, I'll give you the final word. Um, and I want to turn it to other members of council, see if there's any comment. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll start off again. Um, very important issues discussed. Um, mainly these issues sitting around uh, um, longstanding racism, uh, entrenched poverty, uh, um, issues of systemic racism that exists in the city of Wilmington. Um, unfortunately, this is going to be a long fight. Um, this bill doesn't necessarily solve all the ills that we have. And um, a lot of the advocacy energy, uh, unfortunately, is always sitting under the city council when really it should be in Dover. Um, and we uh, often with the city have very little resources to do a lot. And as you'll see, um, one thing I'm going to touch on this is the ARPA. A lot of the planned funding is going towards violence prevention um, and housing stabilization, issues that we talk about here today. So every dollar we take off from there, again, it's a, it's a counterbalance. And, I, and I, the members of the committee get it, but it's, it's a hard process and we need um, state and county money to a lot of times support what we're doing in the city. Um, so I, we, we certainly get that the state is slow um, coming out with funding, but um, we have to plan a path forward. And um, 
I think there's some tweaking that can be done um, in order to make this effective plan, uh, especially for renters. I, I do understand the renter plight. I think extending it to all homeowners carte blanche is a little broad um, because, again, we have the situation of people who can pay and won't pay. Um, but I think renters is a unique situation, and I um, implore maybe in working in conjunction with the prime sponsor, we can maybe find some amendments that um, I think would be receptive and, and make this work because I do see the plight of renters. But extending it to homeowners, I see that as very problematic um, because, again, we have a situation where there's homeowners who can pay, who will be included in part of this, and uh, they just simply won't pay. So I believe that's unfair. But I do believe you, if you truly can't play, we should be able to um, eliminate amnesty something. And we can use ARPA for that. So that's going to come a little bit later tonight. What I can say is I think this is a little broad. Um, and, I, and, and I really implore some tweaks so we can make it a little more narrow to give it to the folks who actually need the assistance. So that's my two cents. Um, I know some of my colleagues will share their thoughts, but I definitely Glad this is brought to light because there are outstanding issues regarding water that have existed in the city. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm going to kick it to members of um, the committee here in person first, if there's any comments. Uh, Vice Chair Harley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank all those that came out tonight um, to voice their opinions and um, their statements that they had to share as it relates to the, the Homes campaign. Um, I know most of you are getting paid to knock on doors to get this information, and some of those are volunteers. This is not, first of all, there are volunteers and there are some people that are getting paid that are working with the Homes Campaign. And this is not designed, I'm not saying this as a put down. I'm just saying that I appreciate those that are getting paid and those that are volunteering to get the information that you're saying that you're sharing tonight. So what I'm saying is that, again, I'm just going to reiterate my uh, support for those that are having a hardship, those that need the assistance, and if they cannot get in touch with um, our, our, our 311 or whomever they're trying to get in touch with in the city, if they live in the 4th District, since you knocked on doors, you got information, you got names, you got numbers, so please feel free to give them my name and number. I want to be able to support anyone that is having a hardship and even a person or individual or resident that has been disconnected. I heard you loud and clear tonight, and we definitely want to be able to support those that need the help, but we definitely do not need people to be in the same position six months from now that they're in right now. I just don't see how we would be helping them at all, especially not knowing who the individuals are. My, my concern is really identifying the people that really need the help. That's what I really would like to do so we can, like you said, help them. How can we help them if we don't know who the individuals are? So I just agree with my uh, Mr. Chair, the finance chair. We're just going to have to continue to work this out and, and really identify the people that need the help. Thank you. Um, and, uh Chief of Staff, Washington, you have a just, just one more point of clarification. Uh, you just mentioned that the renters need the assistance. And so uh, to Brett Taylor's point, um, the Low Income Housing Assistance Program helps the renters. And that's administered by the state. And, and we're working in conjunction with the state to get to make sure they get that assistance. And that's approximately, what, $2.5 million? $2.5 million. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Oliver. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I have to agree uh, with all my colleagues here and who spoke on the telephone. Uh, one point I'd like to make clarity for the public is that uh, Chief of Staff uh, Tani Washington just um, made a phone call, text, et cetera. So the portal is updated, so you can call 311. Anyone that needs assistance with your water bill, please share, uh, tell a friend. We have some um, money still in there, almost close to 100000 If the portal, if it was a, a glint in there, IT, that is over. So if you're knocking on doors, as uh, Councilman Harley said, um, I have to give um, Ms. Miller and the Homes Campaign, you know, kudos. I think y'all doing a great job. Um, as a matter of fact, um, two people called me 
from because y'all knocked on the door in the third district and they called me and I was uh, able to assist both of them with their uh, water bill and one did have an issue with the landlord but nevertheless if you have anyone that's living in the third district please feel free to ask them to give me a call I'm glad um, that it is clarified that the portal is open so if anyone needs some assistance Please share it. Now, that's something to put on Facebook and something to go live about, you know. So we always, sometimes you talk about so much of the negative things, but the, the, um, the glitch was cleared up tonight, and it is money available, so I will be sharing it on my Facebook page also. Um, as, uh, everyone is, <clears throat> as everyone has uh, stated, um, no one wants to see anyone without water. I've been there before, so, and I didn't get put out by L and I because it was only off for one day. Um, but nobody even wants it off for one day. So, with that being said, I'm willing to work with the sponsor also if there's some things we can, you know, critique, you know, to try to come up with something else. Uh, but a moratorium, as I stated, <clears throat> and I live by this, and you can quote me on this. I have friends, and I know people who work in the water department who have came to me who's been working there for 15, 20 years, who have families, who have mortgages, so I don't want to see them lose their jobs. So that is my main reason for not supporting this. And um, as I stated, they called, they called upstairs. They came up on the ninth floor, about five of them, very upset last week, and talk about some people. Uh, and I was emotional with them. So I would hate to see uh, the three women and the two men who've been in that department not talking about the rest of them who are down there making phone calls but don't want to show their face. I would not want to see them lose their job uh, on this moratorium. Thank you. So, that's, um, like I said, I won't be resporting it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, online, we have uh, a Council President Congo. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I want to thank the administration and everyone who has put together um, systems for the ability for our our residents to receive uh, help um, to pay their water bills, but it's obvious that that system is broken. I'm um, just from hearing from our from our communities this evening, not only the glitch, but before the glitch, uh, there was a young lady who spoke to how she just constantly called and never received um, any guidance. And she is someone who is more than capable. So I can only imagine those who don't have her capability, what they must have um, been going through. Um, so I think that first we need to make sure that our system is 100% running and able to, uh, you know, to help the way it's intended to. Um, it's okay to say that we can that we can help and that we we can set up payment plans and we do have funding, but if, if it's if it's nearly impossible or extremely difficult for the average resident to have that kind of access to that to that help, I think that we are. Um, not fulfilling our, our, our responsibility. Um, and also just speaking to this, you know, if this legislation does move forward, that it does not have the, the accompanying financial piece uh, and that would make it illegal. I think it's up to us as a council to make it, to make it legal and to make it, um, to make it the right piece of legislation, not on behalf or for the sponsor necessarily, but for the people of Wilmington who we all represent. So if we do need to put a, a, to add a compatible financial piece to this legislation, so it won't be illegal, let's, let's do what we know that we're able to do and make it a legal piece of legislation and not get caught up on a technicality that we all can fix, um, that we're more than capable of fixing. Um, and, and we have the, I, I could see if we didn't have the money or if the money wasn't available. I don't, I can't see our city being in, in a state of, um, financial disrepair in six months. But there is money that we have access to, um, whether it's the ARPA money, whether it's the federal money, our city is not gonna go under in six months. But some of our residents might. So I just think that we just take our time and do what we're supposed to do. And then we're, we're, that what we are fully capable of doing for our people who put us in office, it's not gonna crush the city. And we know that it's not going to crush the city in six months because the money is there. And there have been people from our community who have said where to find money. I definitely want to give a, th a, a thanks to Christian and everyone from the Holmes campaign for just identifying where the funding is. And our residents just need a little bit more time to, to access that funding. And this is insane that, that nobody ever has to pay 
this is just saying that they have to pay a little later. And again, our, our city is not going to go under in six months. So this isn't giving every, anyone a free pass, but it's just giving people, everyone, a little bit more time to, to make themselves whole. And I think that's what we're in office to do. So I'm definitely going to support it. Um, hopefully it will have enough votes to go before a full council so that we can see where all council members um, sit on this extremely important issue. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Councilmember McCoy. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for actually coming out and speaking about this. Um, the, all the information that was actually brought before us, the uh, my attention was turned to the water bill pre-print pandemic. Um, I noticed it was like a, a drastic change that happened when we switched from quarterly to monthly, and this is the reason why I focused on it. And now, you know, that we're actually with the pandemic, with COVID, we're actually getting a chance to look at it from another light. So I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone who actually came out and brought that information forward. Thank you very much. Council Member Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, thank you to Christian and the Holmes campaign and Brandon, you spoke with so much passion and i truly appreciate that as a councilwoman and as a just a resident of the fifth district um i would like to say thank you um uh, commissioner um taylor as well my story is i have been on that list not one time but a couple of times and it was very disheartening it broke my heart. I didn't know what to do. And I'm not going to tell you I didn't get the bills. I did get them. I got the letters. And what I did, and I'm going to say what um, Councilwoman Oliver said, I just be like, that's going to be my last bill to pay. But until they hit home, like they were going to cut my water off, I knew that I had to call. Now, did I have to call around? Yes, I was determined to call around, and I was determined to make sure that I got on a payment plan so that I wouldn't lose, so I wouldn't be kicked out of my house that I own. So do I sympathize with those who, who can't pay the bill? Yes, I do. Do I, um, have I felt that, that gut feeling like your water is about to be cut off. Yes, I have felt that and I know what it feels like and it is not a good feeling. So I am I am not exempt because I am a council person. I'm a human being and I am a community person and I'm a community activist. And I do want to say that I do um, reach out to my constituents and I want them to know that I'm always here and nonetheless, they know I'm here. So they know how to reach me. They have my numbers. But I will say it again, for those who live in the 5th District, please call the office, tell them that you live in the 5th District and you need help or you need some type of assistance calling 311 or you need some type of assistance getting through to the finance department to hopefully set up a payment plan if you're on that list. Um, and again, I would like to um, to thank uh, Mr. Uh, the Commissioner and I hope that we can hurry up and find a way that we can um, kind of get this get this partnership moving with the state so that those those in need of that that money that's sitting there um it can be used and um i have to go back to what um mr chair said you know everybody comes at the city but you know it's newcastle county and the state that holds the bag you know we're like the lowest hanging fruit here um so when you meet with us Take the same passion that you meet with us and, and, and go to Newcastle County and go to Dover as well. So that way that that so that we're all on one accord. Um, other than that, um, thank you everybody for coming out. This really touched me and I am, um, you know, I, 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 I just didn't know, you know, I didn't know should I say my personal business or not, but we're human and I had to let you know. So um, I don't sit on a, a pedestal. So again, uh, thank you. I appreciate everybody, um, and that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And I think everyone, and especially the public, appreciates the personal stories, as I know that touches us all. Uh, I know you've confided in that and me, Council Member Fields, that we all have those difficulties. So thank you for, for expressing that. Um, now, uh, as it's just a matter of course, I believe Council Member Darby, the floor is yours, as this is your ordinance. Um, as the ordinance, as you know, needs to be voted out of committee. So. Prior to any move, uh, do you wish to have any final comments or 
statements? Yes, I do have a few final comments. Mm -hmm. First, I want to say thank you to the community for putting the pressure on me. I'm making me aware of the situation and what's going on with other community people for bringing me out to the community to speak to the people who are affected. I might only be 105 families, but they matter. Um, a few things I do want to say is that three, the 311 operators probably need to be retrained tomorrow on the information about the program because today at 4 p.m. they were called and they said the water assistance program was not up and running. So that's another thing that could be put on the list for tomorrow. Also, um, the question was asked, how do you identify who needs help? And I say that by going to the people. We have to, as council people, stop waiting for someone or residents to reach out to us. You have to go to the people. You have to go knock on doors. You have to speak to the people, not going to these events and seeing the same people at the same old events. Like actually speaking to the people is where you go to identify who needs the help. The ones who really need the help are not on this Zoom call tonight. Because you think they care about this council meeting and they, they don't have water? They have bigger issues to deal with just how to survive. So I am well, well aware of this being illegal, right? I knew this going in um, because I did not have the fiscal information. So the next step is submitting that. So I, I put this out here not for a vote tonight because I'm going to hold it. I knew coming in that I was going to hold this, but I wanted the community to be heard. I asked them, should I hold it? Should I hold? No, we want to come out and speak. We want to hear how our city council people feel about this legislation. They wanted to hear how y'all how y'all were going to respond to this. Mm. They wanted to know your stance on if somebody should have water or not. This is not about if someone should pay their bill or not. This is about if someone's water should be cut off for non-payment because they don't have it. It's not saying that someone, you guys are thinking that someone is lazy or taking advantage of systems. This is not the case. If you are able to identify who and actually speak to them, you would know that this is not the case. Of course, you have them rare instances where, of course, you have a few who are going to take advantage of, a, of the system, but that's not the majority. So we need to stop painting that narrative of our residents. Like, that tells me a lot of how you see people who live here in Wilmington and that you're supposed to be representing that you think all of them are trying to take over or lazy or trying to take advantage of a system. No, the majority of people want to pay their bills, but they cannot. They cannot even get on a payment arrangement. So this legislation is going to be held tonight. I wanted the community to be heard. We're going to go back to the table because the money is there. The funding is there. So the city can sit here and tell us all they want, that there is no money for this. There is money to cover someone for six months and then for us to be able to address other issues with water. So this legislation is not about shutting off. This legislation is about not shutting off people's water bill. This is not about if someone is going to pay or not. This is about helping the most vulnerable communities that are not here tonight because they're trying to survive two to three jobs. Kids got to wake up early tomorrow trying to figure out how they're going to feed their kids tonight. Those are the people that I'm speaking for that can't come here to the city council meetings um, that are that are not here tonight. So I want to say that this there's funding available. The city needs to be held accountable. And I want to thank you again for the community for coming out tonight. And I'm holding this legislation. Thank you very much, Councilmember Darby. Um, I appreciate the engagement as always. Uh, uh, you know, you you bring a lot of issues to light, um, which has which have been um, sitting here and, and I, I think have not been addressed. So. Thank you very much. And with that, um, we will, of course, it's the sponsors choosing to hold it. So we will, um, I think, um, reassess this as we work to get this plan right. Um, so I'm going a little bit out of order just because I, I know uh, we, we obviously, the, uh, the big question uh, it has always been about ARPA, and that is a item on the agenda. So while folks are still tuned in, I did want to address this issue. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit out of order and actually talk about the uh, ARPA funds, uh, which is um, item number um, five and six on the agenda. First, um, can we have a general update from the administration on where the ARPA spending is right now? Not proposed projects, but where the spending, where, where the purse is right now. The spending has really do not we, I'm sorry, the spending really has not changed since the last time I was at the committee. We still have the same. Um, Excuse me, if, if folks need to talk as we transition, we, we can certainly take it outside, okay? 
want to make sure we're here for the ARPA. Uh, if you want to speak on the AARPA, we're, we're certainly here as well to address those questions. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, so it's the same organizations, but they're just progressing, and and um, that's mm -hmm. been down for that for that contract. So Miller Three, for instance, you know they accumulated additional invoices, and and you know there's some additional costs that have that have um, come through the ARPA as a result of their invoices. That's just one, the Habitat for Humanity, but there's no additional allocations. Okay, is it the same information that we've updated the public on before where the, um, where the, uh, what is it, the uh, purse, the purse, yes. uh, the fiscal, uh, the, the city purse is online. It's, it's online and any changes to the expenses regarding ARP is updated regularly through MUNIS every 24 hours. So if there's a, uh, an expense that, that comes against the ARP, it's updated in our OpenGov system, you'll see it. And if there's expenditures, uh, certainly Finance Committee and Council will be uh, updated correct. on those expenditures. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, very well. And um, just as a formality, are there uh, any questions from Council uh, Committee members specific, specifically on the spending? of ARPA so far. Any questions by council members? Yes, got them. Okay, council member Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at the ARPA spending um, with the neighborhood stabilization, revitalization. Uh, well, council member, we were actually, the resolution is next. Okay, I was we're just talking about the spending part, then the resolution of what we're going to spend. Okay. That's the big next. part okay. that uh -huh. everyone's Go interested ahead. in, I'm probably. Um, okay. I'm, I'm on number five, and then we're going to bump to number six. Got you. Okay. I was on the wrong one, so okay. Any, any other questions by members of the committee on ARP spending so far? All right. Um, any questions from other members of council on the ARPA spending? All right, I'm going to kick it to members of the public uh, who are first here in person if there's any questions about ARPA spending right now. I think more should be done to uh, Mr. 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 Smith, if you want to come up, we, we can certainly acknowledge you. Yeah, let's see, we're going to this part and then that one. No, this is next. That's next. Yeah, I'm going out of order. Yeah. It's two issues. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Chairman. I think more should be done t for youth, for youth and gun violence, and cracking cocaine. I look at the numbers in here; it, it seems like a little bit compared to everybody else. Also, in this whole COVID thing, the seniors have been left. The seniors have been left out. It seemed, it seemed like everybody now forgot the seniors. And nobody's concentrating on the seniors. I don't hear the President of the United States talking about the seniors. I don't hear the state talking about the seniors. I don't hear nobody talking about the seniors. But the seniors are suffering. So if we can put some money over there for the seniors and, and reach out to them, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments by members of the public? All right. Hearing. Uh, yes. Yes, Ms. Furman. The podium is yours. I continue my concern about following the guidelines and the emphasis. What is the emphasis of the four points of the guidelines of how the funds are supposed to be spent? And like I said, and I don't think I was clear enough, uh, Mayor Persicki told his entire community that he was going to use the funds to create loans, to improve houses, and offer grants to improve houses. How does that fit into the four guidelines? Now, I would love to see that happen, but I don't think this block of money is intended for that. I, I, can, I don't read it. No. So could we have that discussion, um, sir? Because it's going to just invite an audit. Thank you very much, Ms. Furman, for bringing up your concerns. Um, again, any other questions or comments on uh, the spending part? 
Mr. Fletcher. Yeah, um, I just would like to echo the sentiment that I have already made regarding the regulation and the guidance for the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, a presentation for the City of Wilmington's Finance and Economic Development Committee met on May 25th, 2021, where they said the amount of funding that would be received is 55,345,780. The funds will come to the city in two trances directly from the U.S. Treasury to the City of Wilmington because the city has a population greater than 50,000. The first payment was expected to arrive in the next two weeks. That already came because this was in May. And then the balance will arrive approximately 12 months later, meaning in January of 2022. So use of funds as determined by ARPA are listed that you put together in this presentation to respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses and nonprofits or aid to impacted industries such as tourism, travel and hospitality, to respond to workers performing essential work during COVID-19, and to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. The, the first category for eligible use for the economic recovery says to respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses and nonprofits or aid to impacted industries. Assistance to households, such as utility assistance, counseling and legal aid to prevent homelessness, food assistance, rent mortgage, home repairs, emergency assistance for burials, weather, weatherization and internet access. So I'm just asking the council to follow the guidelines that you all put together to use this money um, in a way that would respond um, to the issues of COVID-19 that have impacted the people of the city of Wilmington. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard, especially for low income residents, and it has destabilized their ability to pay rent and pay mortgages. This funding, according to the presentation that was put together from the Finance and Economic Development Committee, you all says to use that money. I mean, you could say no, but that's what you put together. It was found on the city of Wilmington's website that the Finance and Economic Development Committee put that together. I can send it to you all if you don't believe it. I found it from the city's website, so it's from the Finance and Economic Development Committee. I will send that to you all, but please use, do what you say you're going to do. Do what the, what the PowerPoint said to use the funding for, to pay for assistance for utility payments for people who cannot afford to pay it due to the pandemic. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fletcher. Um, any, any other comments on ARPA spending right now? Um, no, we do have an item on the agenda about the, um, the city's plan. So that's gonna be next. Um, I wanna make it. All right, so, so if there's no other, uh, no, I see a yeah, online, there's a Z Zanetta 21.6, but I don't believe anyone I don't know if your tech is working. All right, Zanetta, please email us if you have a question or comment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I just think that a lot of stuff that I want to mention has already been mentioned, but I like to just be fair and be balanced. Uh, what can be evaluated is those people who were negligent pre-COVID offer amnesty, meaning take off the uh, late fees and the interest and you know, just change the tone. Uh, would you like to do a direct deposit, set up a direct deposit of maybe $5 per week or $10 per week or $20 a week? What would be reasonable for that person or that individual? I find that uh, most people are willing to pay off their bills. Um, and then um, for those who of course, who are, have been impacted, the money that has been allocated to the state of Delaware should be used to help them. And, I'm, and like one gentleman said, he, no one knocked on his door. He didn't know there was help out there. I think it's our duty as public servants, those who are, who are actually employed as public servants, and then us as also as volunteers who work for free, go and knock on these doors and contact those people and let them know that the help is here so that there can be some balance once this pandemic has kind of eased out maybe in 2022. 20, uh, so for the young lady who said that she was afraid for people to use their jobs, I'm sorry, but I think it's a poor excuse because their jobs should not be lost. People still need to pay their bills. You don't need to get rid of the personnel. People still are paying 5 or $10 here and there. 
and in, even with the with the vouchers or whatever, how the money will be dispersed for those who will get it from the relief. They they still need to process those payments, so no one should lose their jobs, and no one should not be without water. And I think that's about it for me. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. I appreciate you hanging tough through the IT issues. So I know you couldn't, you weren't able to speak last time. So thank you. Um, so now I kick it back on just ARPA spending. Back to members of council. If there's any other final question or comments, I believe I have Council Member Darby. Yes, my only comment. I just want to remind um, everyone is that it was deemed. Um, by the administration that council will not be able to make decisions, the final decision on, or any decision really, on how ARPA funds are spent. I wanna make that very clear, that we are not making any decision. It is up to the mayor administration. That's where the pressure needs to be, on the mayor administration. What we can do as council people though, is of course advocate, make suggestions, make recommendations, and you know, this is just a courtesy that the mayor administration is even coming here to even tell us what they're doing with the money. They, they don't have to tell us. And the city council, the legislative branch, does not have any power over how this is being spent. So they could say all day that, oh, we're having meetings, we're meeting with city council, we're getting recommendations. At the end of the day, they make the decision. So I want y'all to understand and know that, and that's something that I hope will change in the future where there's a balance in power, because we live in America in a government where three branches of, <laughs> of branches were created to create that balance that we need in government, where you don't have one part of the government making decisions. So I think that's, I hope the public knows that. I don't think you guys are getting that narrative because a lot of people come to me saying, hey, why aren't y'all doing this with the ARPA funds? Man, you got, call the mayor administration. <laughs> that's all on them. So I want that want to make that very clear that it was deemed based off of the colder charter that city council will not have any voting power over what happens with this $55 million. It's in the hands of one branch, and that's the executive branch and the mayor administration, that's what a pressure needs to be put. Thank you, administration, that's what a pressure needs to be put. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. All right, um, and that was the update. Now moving to, it's the last item on the agenda, not the last item this evening, but it's the um, sixth item is the resolution um, to approve the $55 million in grant funds from the American Rescue Fan in accordance with the Department of Treasury's interim um, final rule. Now, um, as I think one of my council members, I think, <laughs> flatly put it, um, there is some legal uh, gray area in, in regards to this. Um, as it stands right now, at least for just basic grants, um, this is an executive function. Um, although I say in council, we think it's some long-term um, spending um, does require council approval, but that's a talk for another day. Um, what, what I can say is the proposed plan from the administration right now, um, I think, uh, touches on a lot of the areas and it's, and it's been um, as a part of these months and months and months, almost six plus months of conversations, listening to community groups, listening to our city workers, listening to groups like the Homes Campaign and the NAACP. This is what the plan is. So the overall plan, again, more details, I believe, are forthcoming from the administration. But here's the broad overall plan. Um, I believe it's uh, $12 million to replace lost revenue. That's just right off the top. That's looking at the fiscal hole that the city is in uh, and lost in, in revenue and wage tax. That is the number I think the administration is uh, looking at in terms of getting us back to square one. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at about $4 million in workforce development for uh, skills training and internships. $5 million to assist nonprofits in restoring um, programming in cities. $300,000 for each council matic district. That means all 13 council members will have their own uh, uh, equal uh, funds to uh, assist their district or work as a team and assist um, parts of the city. Um, $22 million for capital investment in underserved communities and safer communities. $8 million to make our neighborhoods safer 
through grassroots gun violence and um, crime reduction. Um, and lastly, on the two major points are $2.5 million in essential pay for our essential workers who have carried all city residents through this pandemic, an additional $2.1 million to meet um, compliance requirements. It's, it's a lot of money, um, and it doesn't give justice to the amount of time I spent on it, but I can just implore everyone in public that this has been timeless um, uh, amount of effort. I know the public doesn't always see the work that we do, but I know um, both me, my uh, council member Oliver, council member Harley, and the rest of us, good amount of us work at this job 24 seven. There's a lot of negotiation, a lot of back and forth, a lot of stuff the public does not see. And it's for a reason, because to get this plan crafted took a lot of work in engaging with nonprofits, getting um, our ideas. And so as we go through the next months, we're going to, um, I believe the intent is to make announcements about specifically which nonprofits get how much, and that works out. But without further ado, I just want to kind of let you know from the finance committee perspective what we've been doing. We've been using our power, um, uh, you know, to push forward. Come on. And, um, and with that, and, and, and with that, I will turn it to Chief of Staff Washington to give the administration's insight into this ARPA plan. Well, um, Chairman Johnson, I think you, you summed it up. And actually, this came as a result of the ongoing dialogue that we've had with City Council on many occasions. Ever since we received the ARPA funds, we've engaged with Council on the use of it. And what you have before you are the broad categories. And we, we've heard, like, okay, we, there's not money for seniors. But part of that is community investment. The money that goes to nonprofits can address senior issues, just, just to put that out there. So you have these broad categories. It may not be very detailed in what, what it's going to be spent on, um, but seniors can be addressed through community investment. The other thing is, is that, you know, there was some questions around compliance. Before a dollar is spent in this ARPA money, we have our law department that reviews the qualifications of that spend down. So we are in compliance. We've hired um, uh, program managers, project managers to actually assist us with the reporting requirements related to ARPA. So we will definitely have uh, compliance around the ARPA spend down. Okay. And that's a follow up question. Um, as I know, the question, top question, all of us have, we have our list that I know we've sent to you. Um, I've sent a list of nonprofits. Uh, I believe every council member has. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do about this compliance? Because I, I, with federal money, is, is every nonprofit going to be eligible to receive the funds or are we going to have to do pass-throughs with some organizations that say are smaller and can't really handle federal funds? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Normally with these grants, we would be administering the, the allocation of the funding. Uh, anyone who receives it's going to re become what they call a subrecipient. Those subrecipients are going to be uh, have the same compliance obligations that the recipient would have. Mm -hmm. What we've done is we've hired a, a, a firm to come in and actually help nonprofits, some of the other organizations work through capacity building to ensure that they are following the compliance rules with regard to finances contracts, um, you know, uh, uh, minority-based enterprise hiring, those kinds of uh, opportunities. So we're going to be watching that very closely. Yes, there's going to be scrutiny on the program. Yes, we know what the interim guide, guidance looks like. Uh, and uh, the firms that we're bringing in have experience in other cities and other, other counties with respect to how the ARPA money is being spent. They have, you know, deep deep understanding of what the grant uh, process looks like. Okay, th th thank you very much, Director. And as a final word before I kick it to my colleagues, again, this has been a lot of work. Uh, I appreciate the work your finance department at OMB have been doing. Uh, we talk about a lot about what we need to do to strengthen our neighborhoods, especially around gun violence. Um, so uh, are we still, as a city, are you still taking ARPA ideas? Because I, I always uh, get that question. I know I probably got two proposals today. So are we, is the door closed, or is this now that we have this outline, is it um, organizations can still uh, reach out? Um, we, we didn't close that, that 
email address. So if people have ARPA ideals or want to submit proposals, we, we still accept them. Okay. But, okay. I mean, you know, let's just, we have a reality around this money. It's, it's limited, um, and it definitely will have to follow, they will have to follow the ARPA guidelines if, in fact, we decide that they're an organization that should receive some funding. All right, thank you very much. And it's ARPA ideas at WilmingtonDE.gov, mm -hmm. email address. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'm going to kick it to my colleagues. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, Vice Chair Harley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think one question I think the, the community probably is wondering is when will we know for sure when these funds are going to be distributed, an estimated time? I want to say we're going to start some spin down on this within the next month or so, but that doesn't mean that we'll hit every category. So you still, you see the various categories. I think some of this would probably hit um, the neighborhood revitalization um, part of this category first. Um, and of course, with the, um, the revenue replenishment, we definitely have to put some focus around that. That's critical so we can maintain you know, our city operations. But, yeah, so, I mean, it's going to be in phases. It's not going to be all at once. Mm -hmm. But we'll make an announcement. We'll make, you know, we'll, there's a plan, and, and you'll see it as we roll it out. Okay. And, and just one follow-up, Mr. Chair. Chair. And so when do you estimate that we will get the second iteration? That's, uh, that was, that's a year from the first time we received it, and we received it when? We uh, received it, I, I believe we received it in... Um, so October, October. around there. So it's so actually be two year. years from this past October. The reason why I wanted to ask that question because it's quoted all the time that we have 555 million. We don't have that right now. No, we do not. And just to give the community some idea as to when that will be, um, the second iteration will be coming. Yes. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Gray, are you still have your hand up or? Councilmember Gray, you're okay. Um, all right, uh, Councilmember McCoy. Council. Wait, uh, uh, Council Chair, can you hear me? This is yes. Councilwoman Gray. Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Sorry about that, Councilmember McCoy. Thank you. Wait, the floor I is would yours. just like to compliment Councilwoman Darby for explaining to the public our level of uh, uh, enactment in the selection process for using the ARPA money. And I would like to say that in reading this resolution, uh, when it was discussed with me, there were specifics, and I don't see them in the resolution. I mean, specific nonprofits that were going to be distributed money in this first um, give out of money. And also, I had requested an explanation of what neighborhood stabilization means. And I haven't gotten that yet. So I would like those specifics for this resolution. It seems rather general compared to what was discussed to me prior to this meeting. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member McCoy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sorry. I actually have turned it down for a second. I don't know whether or not you got a chance to give more, uh, information about the workforce development, the $4 million. My question is basically, are we actually, are we giving this to an uh, organization that actually already has workforce de development, or are we actually going to start something? Are we planning something? What is that? Uh, mean? Any yeah, we'll, we'll likely enter into contracts. Um, we have a couple of uh, apprenticeship programs that we have in mind. Uh, so we'll be entering to contracts with other organizations, not initiating this on our own. Okay. Uh, may I follow the chair? Yes, please. Okay. And the other question was, um, this is the five million to assist the nonprofits. Um, this is basically just a statement. I'm a uh, question. <clears throat> I've been contacting the nonprofits basically because of that whole water situation. And even using my title, it's been taking time to get have people call me back. I'm realizing that they really don't have the manpower to try to, um, I guess, move things as well as we would like. I just wanted to make certain that we were really uh, looking closely at the nonprofits to make certain that they can actually get some things taken care of. It's not that they're not able, like they don't have the heart to do it, but they may not have the manpower. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Dixon. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, uh, Councilman McCoy just asked one of the questions that I um, was going to ask. But in addition to that, um, I just wanted to know for the neighborhood stable neighborhood um, revitalization for the 22 million um, is the land bank included in that, or is that um, a separate entity um, in this? The land bank will be included in that. Yeah, that's a part of it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question or comments by members of council for our kick to the public? All right. Um, uh, yes, council member. No, thank you. Um, I would like to comment on the neighborhood stabilization. I'm looking forward to um, some neighborhood stabilization in some areas in the part of Wilmington um, that have been neglected over the years. Um, so I'm looking forward to some of the funding, hopefully, to come in some of the neighborhoods, such as the east side, such as the northeast area, um, that we have a lot of uh, vacant properties that have been sitting for um, quite a long time. And I'm looking forward to um, some of uh, this money to go into the neighborhoods who need it the most. Um, I heard the lady speak from Highland talk, um, and, and made a statement that she didn't think the money should be towards um, the neighborhoods, uh, na some neighborhoods. Uh, but maybe up in Highland, she doesn't have a lot of vacant properties, or maybe it's just a big understanding. But in the area that I live in, I'm looking forward to some of this money to revitalize some of the areas that have been forgotten for years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That but falls on door. Excuse me. Point of order. Excuse if me, you have public me. comment, yeah, you, you can. Um, we are going to the public. It's, it's no, we, we not. We're we're going to be in public comment in a few minutes. Um, that, finish up with the second comments by members of council uh vice chair hartley yes so um thank you mr chair uh quickly i want to um also ditto the remarks of council member oliver as it relates to housing stabilization um how home repairs was definitely one of the el eligibilities um in the arps funds and as council member oliver said um there was a lot of I want to say um, areas on the east side that need home repairs, revitalization, development, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I have been it's attending. It's totally ignore me all the time. Not speaking, uh, but. Council Member Gray, point of order. We're going to um, put you on mute. And as I was saying that I am attending <laughs> meetings as it relates to the re revitalization over on the east side, and there are at least four housing organizations that are involved with the revitalization of the east side and that is definitely an improvement and the residents on the east side are very excited about it and we most certainly are happy about those funds and dollars being utilized for stabilization in that community thank you mr chair thank you uh council member gray now now the floor is yours sorry um, that was my initial question. I'd really like an explanation on the neighborhood stabilization program as the mayor sees it, because there are areas in the first district also that are vacant, boarded up, and need some assistance, and lots of homeowners that are elderly in my district that need assistance. So I'd really like to know what are the components specifically of the neighborhood stabilization program. And if uh, uh, Chief of Staff can address that, or if she can send me an email, um, I would really like to know. Thank you very much. I, I can follow that up in writing, but in, for all intents and purposes, it covers the, the whole realm of addressing issues with, in a for, for affordable housing. And that's affordable housing in your qualified census tract, but that, that includes facade improvement, demolition, and the rebuild of new homes. So it's a, it's a whole array of different types of services when it comes to affordable housing. Okay, and thank you very much, Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. um, there's no other comments or questions by members of council. At this moment, I'll turn it to members of the public. Um, if there's questions or comments on the ARPA uh, fund. I believe we had uh, Mr. Crespo signed up first time. All right, I think you were first on the list. Mr. Crespo, mm -hmm. the podium is yours. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Jerry Crespo, uh, former president of Local 320 for the city municipal workers. 
I'm also representing uh, members of the 1102 Union, uh, President Stephen Colon, uh, which he is in support of our workers receiving compensation. Uh, Tanya, uh, want to say now, because uh, we've been asking uh, for a while, they've been driving me crazy at mm -hmm. the yard. Uh, but I uh, want to say thank you for considering our workers that worked before, during, and still working during the pandemic. And uh, my question is, uh, if I can ask real quick, I see it's 2.5 million uh, for first responders and essential employees. So that does include police, fire, and the city workers? First question. It's a no. <laughs> you want, I can respond to you in writing. Uh, okay. I don't, want to, I don't want to do it on the floor. Thanks. Okay. Thank you that, very much, Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. That, that was my question, uh, really, if that included us three. And since she's going to respond in writing, I'll uh, wait for them. But I just want to say thank you again. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Crespo. Um, um, any other further uh, comments on the ARPA from members here, live in person? Uh, Mr. Smith? I just want to say thank you, guys. You all have been very pleasant. Thank you, Chief. And thank everybody. Uh, you gave out a lot of information. And those fees only call when needed. I get a lot of calls from the cities and stuff. Tanya, you can tell you most of the time I don't take them. But I always see city council and stuff at meetings and stuff. So you guys are doing what you can do. And I just ask the general public to be uh, patient with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, Ms. Furman, it looks yeah. like you. Are you are you ready? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The, the floor is yours, ma'am. Well, yeah. It sounds like the emphasis, okay, of the use of the money is for nonprofits and, you know, physical changes, home repairs, and things like that. That's what I'm hearing anyway. Um, but I, don't, I just don't see how that emphasis fits into their guidelines. And it's great if your lawyers can work this around into some wonderful imagination that they can come up with to force a fit. But I think we want to go after housing in a, a completely separate from this. It's a separate kind of funding, is housing, homes, OK? And no, nobody needs it more than our neighborhood, all right? Well, maybe they do. but. I see a lot of boarded up and vacant and drug dealing and prostitution sales all around my neighborhood, okay? So it, it, in this allocation, I just don't think that, that your allocation is conforming. That's just a gut feeling. And, if, and I'm one person, so there's a heavy probability that others will think that too when they read this. Wh where do you see nonprofits in here? The, the fellow that just got up, he represents a group that's been hit and hurt. That's legitimate. A hurting industry. Where are they in your program? What about, it calls out utilities very strongly. Why don't you take that 11000 multiply it by $5, and take that amount of money and put it in you know, the finance department for the water department. Our rates, by the way, our water rates are three times higher than Newcastle County. Where's that money go? Where does that money go? Why can they do it so much cheaper? Maybe we should outsource the water department and all of your friends that work in the water department who've never impressed me particularly can go work for the county. Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. But you'd rather put people on the street, 11,000? Wow. Yeah. That's what you want to do, Ms. Sorry. Oliver. That's what you're suggesting. I think you better look at these guidelines. 
because it'll come back to haunt you. And I know you're not the mayor, but you might want to bring that to his attention if you like it, since you seem to be so interested in his point of view. Thank you very much, Ms. Berman. Um, any other uh, comments on specifically the ARP uh, framework by members here in person? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna turn it to um, the public if there's any comments or questions on the ARPA plan. All right, uh, looks like we have two hands raised online. We have uh, Michelena De Jesus. The floor is yours, ma'am. No, I just wanted to shout out to the last lady because she, she hit it. She hit it. Um, that's all I wanted to say. All right, thank you very much. Um, we also have a uh, Mr. Uh, D. Marquis Hall. Uh, Mr. Hall, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, good evening, and thank you to the public that spoke. Uh, Mike Leonard De Jesus, right on point. The uh, the lady who was present, the lady that is actually standing there saying what it is that she knows to be true from her many years. Her wisdom spoke. She's correct. Imagine this. We're in this meeting tonight, this committee meeting, this special meeting, and we're talking about people that need help. People that don't have the money to pay for the water that they need to clean themselves, to wash dishes, to eat, to prepare food, to put in bottles, to clean out bottles, to take care of basic human needs, not having the money that they need to keep on their water. And then we talk about 500 million dollars or 50 million dollars to me there's no difference between 500 million and 50 million dollars because i've never seen one million i've never seen five million but this administration has the ability if it has the care to take care of the people who are supposed to be represented i'm sorry who are supposed to be represented What's important here, is it how we speak about the issue? Is it how much we care? Is it how strong we feel about it or how many people we can get to mobilize around it? I applaud the fact that the Homes Campaign and community individuals, community rights, activists that have been around for so long, like Ricky Mouse Smith, they came out to speak, to talk about what it was that was most important, and that's the people. Because we have a representative or an electorate, uh, an electoral person, uh, a president, a past president, a now elected mayor, who said that he was a Democrat, who said that he cared about the people. Mike Przicki, who we know is a real estate investor, uh, we know Mr. Mr. Cares, Hall, about please money, cares about money, cares about dollars, cares about property, cares a, about building. A member, personally. Thank we you. have him in position, in control of this money. <sighs> and he's not representing the people that he's supposed to care about. He's not caring about the people because that's not who he is, that's not what he's been. Why would we think that he would do something differently? We have to force him to do something different. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Um, now I'm gonna turn it back to members of council. Uh, again, any final comments or questions? Um, I think the, the comment I, I do have as, as finance chair um, is that if we can't get it right over these next few years, um, I think it's unfortunate for our city. I think now is our opportunity where we can <clears throat> fix some of the wrongs uh, that have been done in the past. Uh, we actually have uh, you know, a few dollars to throw around, a, a few dollars, um, and we're gonna try to make it go as far as it can. 
And what we're looking for is impactful programming. And so what I would say is, uh, I know one of my focuses has been on um, gun violence, um, which we've been pushing um, the administration and police department on. Um, we hope that there's going to be some more announcements soon, um, some more concrete plans. But gun violence, I know, is where, where I'm focused. And I know some council members are focusing on housing. So there's a lot of issues you can get involved in. Um, so please get involved in the advocacy groups that are pushing these reforms, because now it's the time to do it. Um, you know, four or five years from now, the money is going to be gone. And so now is the opportunity. So, um, you know, I certainly know we're ready on council. We're asking the questions. We're going through what's eligible, what's not. I'm saying, you know, we're trying to be creative with what's eligible within legal limits, okay? And, and so, um, trust me, we're at work pushing law department to figure out how we can use this and make it connect to the COVID funds. So, um, please stay tuned. We're going to have a lot more future meetings, more um, breakout, more, more just concrete plans as we get them from the administration, especially around housing, especially around, um, you know, assistance programs uh, for individuals, especially around redevelopment. Um, all that's going to happen. And lastly, gun violence is going to yes. be part of the ARPA plan. So, again, I appreciate everyone's patient. I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating to me. It's not easy. But we're making it happen. We're making it happen for our city residents and our workers, especially our essential workers. So um, thank you very much, and stay tuned. Um, we do have a, um, a few legislative items on agenda, so I'm going to kind of move through those as quickly as possible. Um, we do, jumping back up to an agenda, we have Ordinance 21-58, or Ordinance to authorize and approve a product purchasing agreement between the city of Wilmington and Cambridge Computer Software Agency. Um, this is a this is a uh, vendor agreement. Um, is there anyone from the administration here to speak on that? I think it's in Charlotte on the. Uh, is that uh, Charlotte? Uh, Charlotte. Uh, yes, but I don't believe that's the piece I'm speaking to. Yeah, I believe this is the IT. Okay, this is the, the I, uh, IT okay, purchase. Okay, Director May. Okay, that, that one's yours. All right, uh, is there any uh, just brief insight on this? Yes, thank you. Um, the um, item is to purchase a new storage area network, uh, which is the central point of the city's uh, networking infrastructure. Uh, we're at the end of the term of life for the previous unit of, of we're going about roughly five and a half years. Um, and so we're looking to uh, purchase this unit, to trial and purchase this unit um, to replace that. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments or questions by members of council on this contract? All right. Seeing none, any comments or questions by members of the public here in person or online? All right. I'll kick it back to members of council uh, for any final questions or comments on this IT agreement. Okay. All right. Saying none, since this is an ordinance, it does need to be uh, voted out of committee. Um, is there a motion to move ordinance 2158 out of committee to the full council for a vote? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded to move ordinance 2158 out of committee. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right. The ayes have it. Ordinance 2158 will be on this full city council uh, agenda, the next available date. All right, um, and actually, I apologize. That was the third item. The second item on the agenda is the um, is Ordinance 2157, which is an ordinance uh, to authorize and approve a multi-year agreement between the City of Wilmington and Teladoc Health uh, Services. Is there anyone from the administration here to speak on that? I believe it's it's Director Barnes. Um, actually, Chairman Johnson. Um, I am going to permit Donnie Smith, the employee benefits manager, who has taken the lead on this, to present this. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Ms. Smith, uh, the floor Hi, is yours. Thank you. Um, so this is actually an amendment to the existing uh, Teladoc contract. Uh, right now, we uh, in we just completed year one of the Teladoc um, contract, which is for general medicine. Um, and this amendment is actually to add a service for uh, teletherapy or mental health services. Uh, so this would be added to the remaining two years of the contract and the services would be renewed um, together going forward. 
All right. Uh, th th thank you very much, um, Ms. Smith, for that uh, overview. Is there any comments or questions by members of the council on the Teladoc contract? All right. Seeing none, I would like to kick it to members of the public. Any comments or questions on the Teladoc contract? All right. Uh, going once, going twice, going back uh, to members of the council for any final words or comments. Okay. Seeing none, uh, since this is an ordinance, it needs to be officially voted on committee. Um, the, uh, at this time, is there a motion to move Ordinance 21-57 out of committee to full council for Ms. vote? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move Ordinance 2107 uh, out of this committee. Is there a second? Yeah. All right. It's been moved and seconded to move Ordinance 21-57 out of committee to full council for vote. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Excuse me, 21-057. I'm 057. sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, any on the committee uh, uh, opposed? All right. The ayes have it. Ordinance that 21-057 moves to full council uh, for a vote at the next available date. And last need uh, on our uh, rather <laughs> lengthy <laughs> agenda, but very important agenda, um, we have um, a resolution authorizing the city to accept grant funds from the Nature Conservatory uh, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for the South Wilmington Wetlands Project. Um, and this, before I begin, is something that I am aware of, um, as finance chair, aware of this project, and, and I would like to be added as a co sponsor, um, as this is very vital uh, to uh, improving the condition in our uh, underserved and um, historically. Uh, I guess unjust area as this is not my district, but I'm very familiar with the fourth district and uh, this this Wilmington wetlands area, and especially when we talk about environmental justice, um, this is a the wetlands project has been a, a work of many uh, to make this happen. So um, I know this is Council Member Harley's piece of legislation, so I'll let her take over. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. But I'm going to defer it over um, to our economic and planning department. But before I do that, I just want to say that I am excited and happy about this piece of legislation as it relates to the wetlands. Um, it's been years uh, in the making, getting funding for the wetlands project. Um, some of it has already been implemented. And as we know, um, there is more work to be done and so this piece of legislation um, will allow us to move forward and helping to complete this project, um, even though after this there is still more work and funding to be done, but this is still moving the needle and moving us forward in the right direction. So I'm going to turn it over to Director Flynn and his colleague, Mr. Sean. Thank you. All right, the floor is yours, Director Flynn. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councilwoman Harley and members of the Finance and Economic Development Committee. I'm Jeff Flynn, and uh, we have a resolution, um, a requisite resolution to accept uh, grant funding for uh, the South Wilmington Wetlands Project. Um, as noted, this is an important project that is um, a flood mitigation um, open space project. Um, real quick history, um, this project has you can think of it as having three components. The first component was the uh, initial uh, rehabilitation of 17 acres of land, essentially removing material uh, to uh, create space for stormwater conveyance from the South Bridge neighborhood. Um, that project is about 97% complete. The second phase is the actual installation of the new separate stormwater system underneath the community. Uh, that project is funded, authorized, and funded. And um, that will, uh, those construction documents are being finalized, and they'll go out to bid uh, early in 22. And then from there, a contract will be selected, and the pipes will be built. Sort of the third. Um, the third component is a, an, uh, an extension of the wetland with an additional 10-acre uh, parcel to be acquired by the city and then 
um, material removed and um, an additional 10 acres to be added for, for a total of about uh, 27 acres. The, um, the two grants that um, are contained in the resolution have to do have to do with this third component. And you can see um, one is uh, funding from the Nature Conservancy uh, to um, offset um, expenses that will be incurred by the city in acquiring this uh, second 10-acre parcel. The, the second grant from um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is um, a $400,000 grant that will allow us to start uh, designing the construction documents for this 10-acre parcel. Um, by the way, this grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation would be the second grant from that organization to this project. Uh, the first component of the project, the initial 17 acres, received a $3.5 million grant from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So um, both of these grants are going to save the city money by offsetting dollars that have already been authorized. Um, and uh, we're pleased to have your support on this. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Do we have a map, by the way, of the? Yeah, I like we to. Might. <coughs> oh. OK. Um, thank you, um, IT or WITN. Uh, so for the audience, the green uh, the green sort of L-shaped parcel on the map was the, is the first component that's essentially 97% complete construction. The orange area are the areas of the community where the separate system will be placed. And then the blue square represents the 10-acre parcel for which th these grant funds will be used. Um, and it's worth noting, too, that the 10 acres will also be put in permanent conservation zoned O for open space as we had done a few years ago with the green land. Okay. Uh, so that's all I have to, to present now and I'm happy to answer any questions. Good. Thank you very much, Director. Mm -hmm. I believe there are some, a few questions or comments by members of council. First I'll start uh, in chambers. Uh, we have council member Oliver. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, thank the uh, Economic Development Department for doing an outstanding job. I'd just like to uh, ask Marcel, just to, I'd like to see the copy of the map really well, but I think this is really great. I used to live over South Bridge. I'm from South Bridge, and the wetlands is really important. And this has been an ongoing project, so kudos to Councilman Harley, and I'd like to be um, a sponsor, co sponsor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Walsh. Looks, looks like your audio, are you off mute? Are you waiting? Okay. Uh, well, while we're waiting for Council Member Walsh. I'm sorry, oh. Mr. President. Okay. Yes, Mr. President. Yes. Am I on now? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. you. Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment, uh, and that is, uh, this is a long time coming. A lot of promises were made to uh, Southbridge over the years. And it's nice to see uh, a couple of them coming to fruition right now. Um, but it is well deserved by them. And I also think it's, um, if we look at ourselves as a city as a whole, that we're starting to take care of some of our water areas that should have been taken care of for the last 100 years. And um, if we look at this area and also the, uh, at Brandywine Creek, and you're going to end up being known as a fish lady, uh, Councilwoman, um, since you're involved in all these innovative programs for your district. Um, but it is, I think it's great relief for Southbridge, and I'm sure residents of the area uh, welcome it, and I wish everybody the best of luck with it. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Harley, I believe. Yeah, the, the, this is your legislative, uh, well, actually, 
I'll go to uh, members of the public. Is there any comments or questions specifically on this uh, Southbridge project? Uh, there is a hand up. Um, I believe it's a uh, Hamza Glenn. We can't. We can't hear you. Hamza Glenn. All right, well, uh, while the technology is working out, uh, any questions or comments by members in person or online? All right, I'm going once, going twice, then I will kick it back to members of council. Um, I will, uh, this is her legislation, so I'll kick it to Vice Chair Harley for any final comments or questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, lastly, I just want to um, say thank you to the Economics Development Department for um, applying for this grant. And I wanted to also share with the community that this uh, particular project is going to help with the over 50 year flooding situation over in Southridge, which is definitely going to benefit the community. Um, as it has already been mentioned by Director Flynn, that is definitely going to help with the mitigation and that the community in Southbridge is definitely looking forward to this wetlands project being completed fully. And even as Council Member Walsh mentioned, it has been a long time coming. And as we all know, when different administrations come in, you know, it's a high priority on one administration's list and then it could, you know, it could fluctuate. So here we are um, putting it as a priority um, in this administration, moving the needle forward. And I'm just excited and I hope that my council members would join me in passing this legislation when it comes on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Harley. Um, with that, this is a resolution, so it does not need to be voted out of committee. Uh, it'll be placed on the next available uh, city council agenda, uh, which I believe is this Thursday, the night. So yes. uh, we'll, 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 that'll be going forward. Um, and with that, I again would like to thank everyone for attendance. Um, I know this was a long, uh, long, very long committee meeting um, and, and similar to how we've operated with this council with our budget proceedings. Is that the very important subjects of- Mr. Chair, may I make one last statement if you don't uh, mind? Oh, okay. You, thank you, I know we're closing out. But I'd like to make one last statement. So people at home and, and if anybody's in here, so we can take your time and read through the information. The ARPS uh, does allow us to spend money in housing and that it includes affordable housing. It also allows multiple cities across the country to do so. So when individuals that's listening or whoever's in here tonight, you want to go home and read your information correctly, uh, the ARPS throughout the United States is part of, uh, does allow individuals to do housing projects such as Reach Riverside and other housing projects. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that clarification, Council Member. And again, um, I want to thank everyone for attending. It's not the emphasis. Uh, uh, it's, excuse me, point of order. We, we, we will definitely engage <laughs> in this very important subject in the future, so please stay tuned. We'll talk about ARPA. We'll talk about housing. Um, and we're going to uh, get, get it right for our citizens. So thank you very much for everyone for joining. And I will see you at uh, next. I don't know if we have the date for the January Finance Committee meeting yet, but it will uh, most likely be the first um, Monday, or I guess it'll be the first Tuesday of January. So I appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. S motion second. To second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. All right, any opposed? All right, and that concludes our meeting. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everyone.